Like the villain in a successful slasher movie, some monsters won't stay dead. Also, what do you guys think about the new Book Throne setup? I actually, I think this is a, a much bigger improvement because this, the armrests are like mathematically calculated and they got these things. Look at, look at how cool these are. They're not real though. This is just like fabric and wind. And I don't know how noisy they actually are. So I'm just gonna turn those off for now so that I'm not destroying my audio. Midnight Sun is the catastrophic retelling once again of the original Twilight series. And I hate that I can say that. Almost as much as I hate the fact that I spent $30 pre-ordering this. I spent less money on vintage books that are older than my grandparents. Midnight Sun is Stephanie Meyer's desperate attempt to cling to relevance by performing what is effectively backtracking in book form. A particularly lazy method of writing that I absolutely detest, that is inexplicably prevalent is when authors will retell a story from another character's perspective. The problem with that is they almost always tell exactly the same story with so little difference that you're not getting a new experience. All the reader's doing is shelling out whatever they paid for the book to relive the same story. We've seen this with Veronica Roth, we've seen this with L. James, and now Stephanie Meyer is well, I mean, she did this once before with Life and Death, but I mean, that one was gender bent, and this is just Twilight from Ed's perspective. But this was not some sort of a sudden, desperate attempt at reliving her old success. Meyer originally wanted to publish this book back in 2008, uh, back during the height of uh, the Twilight craze. The, uh, the movies were just coming out at that point. In fact, Apparently, Meyer allowed uh, Catherine, Catherine Hardwick, the director of the first Twilight book, and Rob Pattinson to read a few chapters from this book so they could get a better idea of who Edward Cullen was as a character. A move that should have been viewed as an act of cruelty. Now, telling a story from another character's perspective can be very beneficial. It can actually open up a new perspective and give you a new understanding of a different person's point of view. For example, John Gardner's classic, Grendel, which is the story of Beowulf told from the perspective of the monster. And even though some fans of Myers would say, oh, but that's what this is. This, it's a story told from the perspective of the monster. No, it's not. Grendel was an antagonist and actually had a different perspective that eh, depending upon how you viewed it was maybe justified, but Edward is not an antagonist. He's a love interest and not even a very compelling one at that. So you get a different understanding because you had one viewpoint of Grendel initially. Actually, where is? No, I don't need to map out where my books are. I know where everything is. I've got it memorized. All right, well, my copy of Beowulf is around here somewhere, but Beowulf gave you a perspective from the hero's side of things, and you had one idea of who Grendel was supposed to be, you know, this hideous monster that was attacking the village. But you don't actually get Grendel's perspective. You get a very, a very, limited view of who he was. So to get a story from his perspective is immediately contradictory to what you were told before. And it gives you a new idea and a, a more well-rounded experience. But you don't necessarily have to have an antagonist character for something like this. You could do a complementary story alongside with another side character. A great example that I'm sure many of you are thinking about is Ender's Game and its sequel, Ender's Shadow. Ender's Game tells the story of Ender as he goes through uh, training with a squad of soldiers to defeat the buggers, uh, the enemy aliens in the book. Ender's Shadow follows the same series of events told from the perspective of Bean, one of the kids in Ender's squad. The difference being, while there are some scenes that match up with what happened in Ender's Game, because they're part of the same squad, Bean is unique enough of a character that you get a different experience reading this story than you do reading this story. So it's not like you're retreading old ground. You mostly get different viewpoints and different scenes separate from Ender. I, actually, I don't think he even shows up until like halfway through the book. Don't quote me on that. It's been years since I've read this. And so when you do get a few scenes that actually match up with Ender's game, it's more like a, a nostalgic reference, like, oh, I remember that scene, now we get to see it from B's perspective, that's so cool. It happens infrequently. So those few scenes are 
more of a, a delight in that way. Midnight Sun doesn't do that. There are entire scenes that are repeated almost verbatim. The, the dialogue actually matches up quite well, I will grant, but you're getting exactly the same experience. Nothing new is really learned, nothing uh, is explored. If you read Twilight, then you've read Midnight Sun. Actually, it's a little worse. Midnight Sun has some scenes later in the book that we'll get to that are it's like, <laughs> just why? It gets so overcomplicated. And uh, also special thanks to Thrift Books for giving me this book for free. The, the website is great because, and by the way, this is not sponsored content. This is me telling you guys about a good website. Uh, you buy enough books on that website and they actually get you one for free. So I didn't pay for this. And I did have to replace it because my original copy of Twilight got torn in half, not on purpose. I threw this on the ground and like, I guess the spine was weak and it split right down the middle. But I did go through and check to uh, compare a few complimentary scenes. And uh, I do have notes on some mismatches because someone out there had to check. Might as well be me. Now, like I said, this was originally supposed to be published in 2008. The reason it wasn't is because the brilliant idea of just retelling exactly the same story got leaked. A few chapters somehow got released uh, without Meyer's knowledge or permission. And so she got a little angry. Understandable, it's not fun having your work uh, leaked like that. And she decided to just shelve this for 13 years. And when I say this is exactly the same story, I'm not kidding, about 70% of the book, thereabouts, feel like it was taken straight out of Twilight. And because of that, this is not going to be a run through of the plot. If you've seen my Twilight review, you have seen this story effectively. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and analyze Ed's character uh, through the multiple revelations that Meyer attempts to provide us. And it does provide one glowing character detail about Edward Cullen. And there's the question of why did Meyer wait until 2020 to release this book? Well, it's because it was the worst year on record and she thought she would do her part to contribute. No, it's because she, uh, according to her FAQ, uh, wanted to help out. The cynic in me says that she did it because no one was paying attention to her anymore and she just wanted some easy money. But according to her own website, uh, she did it because she wanted, well, she originally wanted to release it when the world was back to normal, and who knows how long that would be, and uh, apparently you guys have waited long enough. Try saying that to someone who's about to be waterboarded, see how they react. The real problem with it, though, is Meyer said that she wanted to recapture the fun that uh, we all used to have, you know, 20-ish years ago, and, you know, we were all having parties and doing barbecues on the beach and stuff like that which is perfectly respectable, except on multiple places in her FAQ, she complains about how difficult it was to write this story, how draining it was because Edward is a mopey boy. Unfortunately, I mean, there are multiple ways you can write a story and the ways you can pour emotion into a story. The problem with Meyer is she doesn't really understand how to capture emotion properly. So she thinks she's doing one thing and she's actually doing the other. And unfortunately, Midnight Sun is enriched with that boredom she experienced, that tedium of the process of trying to write this book. Especially because according to a 2013 interview with NPR, she said she was so over the Twilight series. And in a Good Morning America video, she said it wasn't fair to keep her fans waiting. It's a crazy time right now, and I wasn't sure if it was the right time to put this book out, but some of you have been waiting for just so, so long. It didn't seem fair to make you wait anymore. And because this book was critically slammed by multiple sources, my favorite of which is from L. Hunt at The Guardian, who wrote that the book was chronically overridden and under-edited, which I think sums the book up perfectly, especially when you compare how thick Twilight is to Midnight Sun. And yes, plenty of tabs, so I got a lot to say. I got about 34 pages of notes, 35 pages of notes, and that will include a rant on Meyer's 
brazen misuse of the pomegranate on the cover. No, 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 no. I'd also like to point out that I finished this book shortly after reading Eclipse, so the type of alcohol I need to properly endure all this only exists in video games. This is Krogan liquor, Rincar. You'll set off radiological alarms after you drink it. But that's enough build-up for now. Let's get into this thing so we can understand how this book takes an aggressive stance against the concept of less is more. And small note, if you see Leia walking around like this, she's uh, wearing a shirt because she's got a cyst on the back of her neck that uh, they're not able to take off yet. Uh, surgery scheduled. She's fine, though. She doesn't really care. She's been super cuddly. So appropriately enough, the book opens up rather cynically, which works because Ed is supposedly a high schooler, but also because he is a miserable little bastard. This was the time of day when I most wish I were able to sleep. High school. Or was purgatory the right word? If there were any way to atone for my sins, this ought to count towards the tally in some measure. The tedium was not something I grew used to. Every day seemed more impossibly monotonous than the last. You'll notice very quickly the way Ed was treated through dialogue in Twilight, and the way Ed refers to things through prose in this are substantially different. An advantage that you have with first-person narration stories is not only do you get to analyze the character through the dialogue that they use, but also through the prose, because those are supposed to be their inner thoughts. The problem in this book is that Ed's inner voice changes, and like, not in a way that seems apparent. It doesn't gradually shift throughout the book. There are chunks where it's pretty clear that Meyer wrote, like, this set of chapters in a couple months and then pause, and then this set of chapters in a chunk and then pause, and then this set of ch chapters, it's, it's inconsistent. But I actually kind of like the initial prose that we get from Ed because I can read it like a stuffed shirt aristocrat stereotype and it sounds terribly appropriate. Like this example on the first page when he describes his telepathy. When it came to the human mind, I had heard it all before and then some. Today, all thoughts were consumed with the trivial drama of a new edition of the small student body. It took so little to work them up. I'd seen the new face repeated in thought after thought from every angle. Just an ordinary human girl. The excitement over her arrival was tiresomely predictable. I want to punch this guy. Now, Ed's telepathy is something that gets hit on a lot in this story. Meyer bashes this concept over our heads, and to a point, she should. Like, to a point, we should get exposed to what life is like constantly being able to read minds. A lot of conversations that he has with his family members, for example, are entirely one-sided, where they will think something and then he'll respond verbally. Or he'll just, in passing, notice things that other people are thinking very casually. He's very used to these powers and uh, the advantages that it gives him. Now, he describes them as being, like, tiresome, and we do get some idea of how they work, like, not very specifically. We don't really understand uh, the limits or what he can really do if he, you know, stretches his powers to their maximum potential. The problem is Ed will occasionally refer to his powers as a burden and they don't really come off as a real burden. Like, they never hinder him in any meaningful way. It's, it's a burden in the same way that you wanted a fork and you have a spoon. Considering Ed is playing the role of a high school student, this opening is terribly appropriate. However, it's also terribly pretentious. While Ed might uh, be able to get away with this because of his age and exposure to classic literature, it feels like he's channeling the snobby, smarter-than-he-looks high schooler archetype, an overdone and usually annoying type of character. Love is just a transaction. We're all hardwired to desire. We present the correct set of desirable traits, and boom. We can turn it on, and we can turn it off. Kid, you're 17. You barely understand how your own mind works, much less the dark secrets of the universe. I think the powers are probably the easiest example to go with the Guardian review of how this book is chronically overwritten because Ed will so 
very constantly go and think about you know how his family members would deal with a certain situation or he will try to read the minds of students surrounding him even though it doesn't really mean anything it doesn't advance the story or help him with some sort of a plot that he's working on he's just reading minds because hey isn't that a nifty trick and oftentimes that results in passages like this alice's mental tone was alarmed now and i saw in her mind that she was watching jasper in her peripheral vision is there any danger she searched ahead into the immediate future, skimming through visions of monotony for the source behind my frown. Even as she did so, she remembered to tuck one tiny fist under her sharp chin and blink regularly. This brush, uh, She brushed a tuft of her short, jagged black hair out of her eyes. So it's a point that they uh, need to act human because otherwise they would just stand there like statues because they're vampires, that's what they do. They don't need to blink or breathe or do any of that. The problem is, Maya relies on this trick of Ed describing other people's minds and perceptions so often that it becomes something of a crutch. Like, she over-relies on this idea, like it's the most brilliant thing ever, somehow, and it kills all sense of pacing. This also feels like a missed opportunity. Because of his telepathy and telling things straight from people's minds, it feels like we're getting a story written in both first-person limited and third-person omniscient writing styles. This could have been a very cl uh, clever blend if handled correctly, but instead it's a lot of show-don't-tell violations. Like, I wanted to go into this book optimistically. I wanted to go in saying that Meyer has somehow improved in her writing craft, but that's like describing a, a guy who's been learning to cook for years and only just discovered how to turn the oven on. But this is all in reaction to Bella's first day at school. And we get this line that Jasper was very dangerous right now, because you know, he's a borderline murder machine, which brings up an old complaint that I have about the series. If he's so dangerous, why let him go to school? He could literally kill someone, or, and worse, get spotted doing it. That would lead to a manhunt for him, uh, that would be trouble for the entire family. Hell, if he drank a kid, it would wind up on national news. He'd have to hide from both human law enforcement and the Voltori. Alternatives would tell uh, would be telling people he's sickly and can't go to school, telling people he's homeschooled, telling people he's already graduated from high school and just teleworks all day. You can't always tell how old someone is from a brief glance. Besides, this is all to keep up a cheap, meaningless charade. What do the Collins get from going to a new high school every few years anyway? Is this part of some quest to collect new graduation hats? They're all loners anyway that uh, Ed says are universally avoided. Do they just go to school to stand out? No, the truth is, if they didn't, then we wouldn't have a story. We. Also, by opening the book this early on with the introduction of Bella's first day, you kind of ruined a chance to really introduce Ed properly on his own terms. Because now, uh, we don't get to see a day in the life of Edward Cullen. We don't get to see him stalking around the house and listening to My Chemical Romance or whatever the hell he was into. We do get some idea of what his backstory was because we get a few flashbacks sprinkled in throughout the book and let me tell you those are draining but to not give us an idea of what his day-to-day -day life was beforehand you've ruined a chance to properly introduce your character it's it's um a classic take on the hero's journey you start by introducing who the character is and how they normally uh go about their day and then there's a big sudden change and they're plunged into a world of adventure. Because we don't see Ed as he's going about class, because we don't see him interacting with his family much, because this this scene is very brief, let me tell you. Thankfully brief, considering some of the later scenes we get. Which is bizarre, because that's kind of what Bella got in, in uh, Twilight. I mean, not really a start of an ordinary day in her life, it was just the start of her new life in Forks. But you still got an established character if you want to be generous with terms and call her a character, but you got to develop an idea of who Bella was before she ran into Ed. A really good example of this that I like to um, cite is Enemy of the State with Will Smith, because you got a pretty solid idea of who his character was in that movie uh, before the, you know, everything with the, I think it was the NSA, um, interfered and screwed up his life. And so at that point, you've got a solid idea of who this character is and how dramatically their life has been impacted. You don't get that with Ed. Especially because he actually spends a few chapters fighting against the destined romance he has with Bella. 
So it's the cafeteria scene, and Ed tries to read Bella's mind for the first time and realizes that he actually can't. One of the things that Meyer wanted to present with this is she wanted Ed to come across as a little more unsure, a little more, uh, you know, dealing with anxiety. You know, he, he wasn't necessarily the uh, cunning, dangerous creature that she assumed he came across as in the first book. Which makes me wonder why the hell she wrote passages like this. Emmett, Rosalie, and Jasper were pretending to be seniors. They left for their classes. I was playing a younger role than they. I headed off for my junior level biology lesson, preparing my mind for the tedium. It was doubtful Mr. Banner, a man of no more than average intellect, would manage to pull out anything in his lecture that would surprise someone holding two medical degrees. Now the anxiety comes later, but right now we are bombarded with Ed coming off as a snobbish asshole. And we get another reminder of Ed's powers as he says that he often wished that he could escape the cacophony. So this seems to confirm that he can't really control his powers and there's something of a burden, but it never amounts to anything. He just says it as a general complaint. It's like if you're complaining about red lights on your way to work, but you still make it into work on time. Well, yeah, they're annoying, but so what? Now, if you want to see this done right, you've got to go to something like Code Geass, where we got a character named Mao who was actually able to read the thoughts of everyone around him. The problem was he couldn't control it, and it became so overwhelming that it kind of drove him insane. But it's time for the big reveal, when Ed finally gets to sniff Bella. But it's time for the big moment, when Ed and Bella finally sit next to each other in biology class, and Ed gets to take in a deep whiff of that good old Bella stank. <laughs> oh man, that sounds so much worse. Bella Swan walked into the flow of heated air that blew toward me from the vent. Her scent hit me like a battering ram, like an exploding grenade. There was no image violent enough to encompass the force of what happened to me in that moment. Instantly, I was transformed. I was nothing close to the human I'd once been. No trace of the shreds of humanity I'd managed to cloak myself in over the years remained. I was a predator. She was my prey. There was nothing else in the whole world but that truth. Why don't you have a seat? And that is all the description you get about that moment. And it's pretty bad. Now, we do get the idea that he was completely surprised by Bella's smell. Okay, fine. Describe it. Poor description of this reaction. We get the impact, but not the impetus. Ed describes how Bella bowled him over and how he was the predator, she was the prey. However, we don't get any such description of what made her smell so good. Nothing to color in things from Ed's perspective. This is like reacting to a freshly cooked steak, but doing nothing to describe what the steak smells like. It leaves the reader out of the moment. Now I'm putting up this barrier, and right behind the barrier is going to be a steak. Using everything available to you, can you describe anything about how this steak smells or tastes like? No, of course not. You have no clues available to you. And while the scent of blood might not be the most appetizing thing for most readers, a talented writer can make it work. For example, in Dead Space Martyr, which is a good book, you should definitely read this if you like, you know, creepy sci-fi thrillers, there is a character who descends in a, what I will just lazily call a bathosphere, with a partner of his, and they get close to an alien artifact that drives him insane. And as part of that insanity, he brutally murders his partner, and then uses his partner's blood to write some alien text all over the walls. From an outsider's perspective, it would make no sense, obviously, but the way the scene is masterfully described, we actually get into the character's head as he is going mad, and we see things from his perspectives in such a way that it actually kind of makes sense why he's doing this. It's difficult to set up and it's not going to appeal to everybody, but I think it's a great example of proper portrayal of madness. B.K. Evanson, you know, good credit to him. You don't always need to relate to a scene or a character's motivations, but you should at least understand it. But the following classroom scene is downright hilarious for all the wrong reasons. So Meyer's got a real problem in that she under-describes things that would color in the universe and character motivations, but she over-describes surface-level actions that the characters take, and that leads to scenes like this. Ed's battling it out in his mind about 
how delicious Bella smells and how much he wants to drink her blood and um, realizes that he wouldn't be able to get away with it. He would have to, because if, if he killed her, then he would have witnesses flee the classroom. And while he was taking care of the witnesses killing them, her blood would get cold. And so we get Ed plotting out this horrid murder scene for a little over two pages. And her blood would cool while I murdered the others. The scent punished me, closing my throat with dry aching. So the witness is first then. I mapped it out in my head. I was in the middle of the room, the row furthest from the front. I would take the right side first. I could snap four or five of their necks per second, I estimated. It would not be noisy. The right side would be the lucky side. They would not see me coming. Moving around the front and back down the left side, it would take me at most five seconds to end every life in this room. Larry, this is an intervention. You need to stop breaking people's necks. What are you talking about? Larry? What? Larry! Our romantic interest, ladies and gentlemen. So that was macabre as fuck. The real problem is that this is all taking place in Ed's head. He's all, he's just thinking this. So everything that he is currently thinking is, it does reveal character, but it reveals this really disturbed character that I don't think Meyer's going for. And it amounts to nothing because none of the things that he thinks about come to pass. So this entire passage, while unintentionally hilarious, is a waste of time. But it does have some top shelf cringe available. For one short second, I was able to think clearly. In that precious instant, I saw two faces in my head, side by side. One was mine, or rather, had been. The red-eyed monster that had killed so many people that I'd stopped counting. Rationalized, justified murders. I had been a killer of killers, a killer of other, less powerful monsters. It was a god complex, I acknowledged that, deciding who deserved a death sentence. It was a compromise with myself. I had fed on human blood, but only by the loosest definition. My victims were, in their various dark pastimes, barely more human than I was. The other face was Carlisle's. What the fuck just happened? So Ed makes multiple references to this monster inside him, and we will see plenty more of that later on. It kind of feels like a throwback to Fifty Shades of Grey with Anastasia Steele's inner goddess. And while that thing was supposed to be some weak subtext about her libido, this is his weak subtext about Ed's desire to kill and drink people. Oh my god. I am losing my mind. Monster also stops showing up a good portion into the book. I want to say like not even halfway through. There's, there's like one reference in the climax, but it doesn't really lead to anything. It's cringe for the sake of cringe, I suppose. And then Bella sits down next to Ed and nothing happens, so we just spent several pages with Ed describing murdering an entire classroom, so he looks like one of the Columbine shooters with a Napoleon complex. And because Bella is so tantalizing and sitting so close to Ed, he's effectively paralyzed and doing everything he can to not give in to his urges and bite her. Hate and irritation, impatience, would the hour never pass? Me for the last 15 pages of this book. And class ends and Ed rushes out and uh, he goes to the uh, guidance counselor or the front office, whatever, to try to change the schedule so he can not be in Bella's class anymore. And we get some uncomfortable thoughts from the, uh, I, I think this is a secretary or something, receptionist. There are multiple clues that this woman is thinking about Ed in a very inappropriate manner. Yes, he's like, 90 or 100 something years old, whatever, but in her mind, he's still 17. So this is very creepy. And yes, vampires are supposed to be particularly alluring and able to charm, you know, any human. But again, the surface level image that's being presented by the author in this moment, and not the only example I can pull up, mind you, is rather disturbing. I don't actually feel comfortable reading any of this.
But Bella comes in and runs into Ed and Ed has to leave and he doesn't get to change his schedule. So he decides to uh, run off for the weekend and go on a hunting trip. And that was all chapter one. I'm not gonna go for a chapter by chapter recap of everything because a lot of the problems just keep coming up like, you know, burst fire from a machine gun. But considering how little happened in the first 22 pages and how much Meyer drags on, it really does give you a, a dire warning for the pacing of the rest of the book. So Ed goes off to hang out with the uh, Denali clan, uh, the other group of vegetarian vampires that uh, the Collins know, and he hangs out with Tanya. Like, it's obvious that uh, Tanya has a thing for Ed, but Ed it has the emotional range of a stump, so of course he just does not reciprocate her feelings. But after a five-page scene with Tanya in which nothing I can actually recall happens, Ed runs back to the Colin estate and we get this line. Was it just last week that this long drab room had seemed so killingly dull to me? I won't say that adverbs are always the enemy, but when you gotta really like wedge them in like that. Go. Sleep badly. Any questions hesitate to call. Bad. Excuse me? Sleep bad. Otherwise, it makes it seem like the mechanism that allows you to sleep. Leave. What? It's Fuckhead? Badly's an adverb. Who taught you grammar? Get out. Vanish. The biggest flaw in the book so far is how painfully drawn out it is. Ed keeps the story contained inside his own head so much so that he barely interacts with the real world. So far, most of this book has been Ed waxing philosophically and just thinking about things. If that's where you want your story to be, like Walden, then so be it. But romance demands chemistry between characters and fantasy demands an interesting universe. So a fantasy romance story cannot possibly thrive by staying solely inside of a character's head. I've been skipping a lot of the bloat in this book. I, frankly, I'm doing you guys a favor because it, this video would get real boring real fast if I did that. I'm, I'm just going to give you a brief example of what I'm talking about so you understand the nightmare that is this book. I try to pay attention to them keeping a grin fixed on my face as though I were, uh, I were part of their banter. I did not allow myself to look towards the line where I knew she was standing, but that was all I was listening to. I could hear Jessica's impatience with a new girl, who seemed to be distracted too, standing motionless in a moving line. I saw, in Jessica's thoughts, that Bella Swan's cheeks were once more colored bright pink with blood. I pulled in a few short, shallow breaths, ready to, qui uh, ready to quit breathing if any hint of her scent touched the air near me. Mike N uh, Newton was with the two girls. I heard both his voices, mental and verbal, when he asked Jessica what was wrong with the swan girl. It was distra distasteful. God, I'm so disinterested in this. It was distasteful the way his thoughts wrapped around her, the flicker of already established fantasies that clouded his mind while he watched her start and look up from her reverie as though she had forgotten he was there. What the fuck is that? It's like that. It's all like that. So little happens! At least half the story is just Ed thinking to himself. Ed keeps slipping between his thoughts and reality in chunks, so the story feels like it's being told by a narcolepsy patient dipping in and out of consciousness. So after staring at Bella for a good long while, Ed eventually has to go back to biology class. And he realizes that this is going to be a bit of trouble for him. Would I go to class, sit beside the girl, where I could smell the absurdly potent scent of her blood and feel the warmth of her pulse and the air on my skin? The last half of that sentence is weird. This is made even worse when you realize that Ed describes breathing for vampires as something that they have to do on a conscious level. They don't actually have to breathe, they just do it to appear human. So every time Ed complains about how good Bella smells, and how tortured he is about how much he just wants to bite into her and take a drink. He's doing that to himself. He is breathing on a conscious level. It's not like breathing for us, where you do it without concentrating. It's, it's, doctor, it hurts when I do this, then stop doing that.
And on page 35 is the start of the conversation between Ed and Bella in biology class, and I mean the entire conversation. This is one of the few scenes that I actually went back and read alongside with the original Twilight, and uh, it, it matches up, like verbatim. It's, oh my god. Like, I wasn't interested the first time, and I'm not interested now. And I do like that Ed reflects at one point that uh, Bella's answers were never what he expected, and they made him want to ask more questions. It does reflect a bit of character, because at this point he's become so unconsciously reliant on his telepathy that he can't read Bella. She is an anomaly to him, and normally I would say that that's good, except you don't need that much space in order to emphasize that point. If you sneeze, the residue that lands on your floor is deeper than these characters. And while we do get a shade of Ed's side of things in this conversation, as opposed to Bella's, what we get sounds more like the loser kid in class trying way too hard to impress people. Like in this scene, they're talking about Bella's stepfather, Phil, and how he plays baseball. Have I heard of him? I ran through the rosters of professional ball players in my head, wondering which Phil was hers. Probably not. He doesn't play well, another smile. Strictly minor league. He moves around a lot. The rosters in my head shifted instantly and I tabulated a list of possibilities in less than a second. And that sounds really stupid, but to be fair, a second is about how long it would take for me to pull up everything I know about minor league baseball. And while Meyer's goal in this is to get us to understand Ed a little more using a template that she has already written and is for some reason limiting herself to, I'm not really understanding Ed on a deeper level. I'm just learning to hate Bella all over again. She was dull then, she's dull now. I mean, these scenes were bad enough the first time, but now Meyer has fluffed them up so much that it's actually hurting me to go through. But it turns out that Ed was not attempting to flirt or get closer to Bella. He was actually trying to scare her off. All the little markers and signs that were sufficient to scare off the rest of humanity did not seem to be working on her. Why did she not cringe away from me in terror? Surely she had seen enough of my darker side to realize the danger. How am I supposed to take this seriously? Seriously, he is intentionally being a creep. Is that supposed to be better than what we thought before? In Meyer's mind, is this actually an improvement? And while Ed might be infatuated with Bella because of her smell, he watches her get into her truck in the parking lot and goes from emo to neckbeard in record time. She combed her fingers through her thick hair, pulling locks through the stream of hot air as though she were trying to dry them. I imagined what the cab of that truck would smell like and then quickly drove out the thought. Yeah, it's possible to make your protagonist an utter creeper and still have the story work. This ain't doing it though. Ed attempts to collect his thoughts by going on a hunting trip with Carlisle, and chapter 3 starts with, Truly, I was not thirsty. Yeah, you are, bro! In a way, this scene does establish his relationship with Carlisle, with Carlisle being something of a father figure, appropriately enough. But the conversation is not worded nearly as well as it should be. I watched myself take a deep breath, saw the wild light in my eyes through the filter of his deep concern. Has any one person ever smelled better to you than the rest of them? Much better. Is this book secretly a parody? Dad, do you ever get that not-so-fresh feeling? You mean from the collection of smegma around the head of my uncircumcised penis? What the hell? No! Well, I... it's natural, son. And while Meyer did want to use this book to expand on Ed's character and flesh him out a little bit, I'm asking questions that I don't think I'm supposed to be asking. For example, we get this scene after they've finished up their uh, hunting trip. While Carlisle went to dress for his early shift at the hospital, I stayed by the river, waiting for the sun to rise. I felt almost swollen from the amount of blood I'd consumed, but I knew the lack of actual thirst would mean little when I sat beside the girl again. So, question about vampire biology that I don't think I'm meant to ponder about. What happens to the blood they drink? Like, I get that it's nutrients for them, and they would absorb it into their body somehow, but, I, I mean, we're dealing with conservation of mass, so if he's feeling swollen, would that mean that there's excess? Is he actually swollen? Is it some sort of a weird 
feeling that he just has for this moment? Or when no one's looking, does Ed go to the bathroom and... PISSED BLOOD! I have no idea how I was able to fit that in, but I did it! But the next day at school, the Collins are hanging out in the parking lot when Alice gets a sudden vision of Bella getting squashed by a car. And we get this long, overly detailed scene as Ed rushes across the parking lot to push Bella out of the way and stop the van with his hand. The general rule that I got from William Goldman was the amount of time that it takes you to read a passage is the amount of time that it should take for the events in that story to actually occur. There are plenty of times when slowing things down and going to extra detail in order to heighten the tension works you know, perfectly well because you know, you, when you're in that moment, when you've got the adrenaline running, your uh, perception of time slows down as you take in every single detail around you. And that could certainly be happening here, but I don't see it legitimately happening for a little more than an entire page. And I'm not saying uh, Alice had the vision and then Ed realized he had to move in order to get over there and then he stopped the van and then Bella was safe. I mean, he grabs Bella here and the van comes to a stop here. And the problem is that Ed's thoughts escape the moment. He should just be concentrating on saving Bella and stopping the van because that would keep the reader in the moment and that would keep the reader invested. Instead, Ed's thoughts drift off and he starts thinking about crap like this. When I heard her head thump against the ice, it felt as though I had turned to ice too, but I didn't even have a full second to ascertain her condition. I heard the van behind us grating and squealing as it twisted around the sturdy iron body of the girl's truck. It was changing course, arcing, coming for her again, as though it, she were a magnet pulling it towards us. A word I'd never said before in the presence of a lady slid between my clenched teeth. I'd already done too much. As I'd nearly flown through the air to push her out of the way, I'd been fully aware of the mistake I was making. Knowing that it was a mistake did not stop me, but I was not oblivious to the risk I was taking, not just for myself, but for my entire family. Exposure. And this certainly wouldn't help. But there was no way I was going to allow the van to succeed in its second attempt to take her life. That was a small portion of the entire passage. And it's even worse when you consider that while this is the start of Ed grabbing Bella, this right here is where Alice first realized what was about to happen. So, amazingly drawn out. Like, I'm almost impressed at how much bullshit and bloat and bloviating Meyer was able to stuff into this book. And after a very lengthy hospital scene, Ed is dismissed and he starts worrying about Bella. It shouldn't have been so hard for me to do the right thing. But all afternoon, I was gritting my teeth against the urge that had me yearning to ditch too, in order to go find the girl again. Like a stalker. An obsessed stalker. An obsessed vampire stalker. Is this Meyer trying to be cute? Cause it's not working! Oh, you think you're being cute? <laughs> so the incident with the van was actually a bit of trouble because it ran the risk of exposing what the Collins actually were, so... While Ed is feeling conflicted in this particular moment, the rest of his family, except for Alice, are a wee bit miffed at what he did. And Ed feels the need to protect Bella, even if it meant going against his family. Part of this is really troublesome writing because Alice predicted that Ed was going to fall in love with Bella and you know, he spent so much time insisting, no, I'm not, she's just a, a, a human or whatever. How could I fall in love with a human? And apparently Jasper has a brief obsession with killing and drinking Bella as well, which that kind of gets resolved with a, a finger wax. Don't you eat that girl! And Ed decides that yes, he would stand up and protect Bella, which I mean, Jasper does get a chance to explain himself and why he wants to go after Bella. It's not just because she's, you know, smells delicious. Uh, but it's also for Alice's sake. He shook his head once, and I will not let Alice live in danger, even a slight danger, 
You don't feel about anyone the way I feel about her, Edward. And you haven't lived through what I have lived through. Whether you've seen my memories or not, you don't understand. Dialogue like this is why I can't take Meyer's writing seriously. My waifu is better than your waifu. It also has an epiphany and decides that he would fight for Bella. He does this out of the blue, though, with minimal buildup. Just last chapter, he was constantly thinking about killing and drinking her blood, and now he wants to protect her because she smells a certain way. This is all a, in reaction to Jasper's thoughts on slaughtering Bella himself, but this still doesn't answer why Ed feels protective. He just does because if he didn't, then we wouldn't have a story. Yes, and this is the moment where Alice reveals that uh, Ed would fall for, uh, for Bella. So much of this is so forgettable, and there's so much needless crap piled in here that it's almost impossible to keep certain scenes in order. If you ever want to just give yourself the Midnight Sun experience, see if you can find a copy at your local library and go to chapter 5, because chapter 5 by itself is a stunning display of how vapid and slow this story is. Ed goes around and he just randomly reads people's minds and reacts to them because at this point in the story, like in Twilight, Bella is doing something else that Ed's not involved in, so Meyer's got to put in filler so that the timeline doesn't go out of order. Because, you know, jumping forward a day or two or giving Ed something substantive to have happen doesn't make any sense, apparently! Then there was the time at lunch when Jessica and Lauren were talking about the number one dream destinations on their bucket lists. Jessica chose Jamaica, only to feel immediately one up when Lauren countered with the French Riviera. Tyler chimed in with Amsterdam, thinking of the famous red light district, and the others began sounding off. I waited anxiously for Bella's answer to the question, but before Mike, who liked the idea of Rio, could t uh, ask for her take, Eric enthusiastically named Comic-Con, and the table erupted in laughter. Like, I barely even know who any of these characters are. I... I vaguely remember them from Twilight, but this far into the book, you get such a surface level breakdown of who these people even are. It's like Ed's mind has a death grip on the mundane. He focuses on so many uninteresting, trivial details around him. Like, none of this bolsters the story or the characters. I... What does this amount to? Why is this here? And I hate that that's not the worst example I can list in this book. You will... Mm, you won't believe me when I give you the worst of it. The narrative that runs through Ed's mind is chaotic and jumps around from topic to topic. While that does give a solid image of what it's like to be inside of a racing mind, with thoughts darting around to and fro much, without much reason, it doesn't make for a fun or entertaining read. It's fine for brief stints, but to make an entire book in that style is exhausting. Ed just lets his mind wander about increasingly shallow subject matter while nothing of substance happens in the world around him. This book can only be described as excessively tedious. This entire chapter, Ed has been retelling stories about Bella or his thoughts around her for the 1000th time, and it comes off as so dull and unengaging that I'm completely glossing over entire sections. This is just like the first book when I had read uh, when I had to keep going back and rereading sections because I was glossing over those. Ed is the protagonist. The story should be about him and his choices, but so far the entire thing has been him creeping on one girl in class while the story flow is getting outpaced by a car without wheels. I'm being serious when I say this. Meyer could actually teach a college level class on how to bullshit and pad out your papers so much that you could write a 20 page term paper and still say nothing. Through all these little things, I was able to add the most important quality to my list, the most revealing of them all, as simple as it was rare. Bella was good. All the other things added up to that whole. Kind and self-effacing and unselfish and brave. She was good through and through, and no one seemed aware of that besides me, though Mike was certainly observing her nearly as often. And right there was the most surprising of my torments, Mike Newton. Who would have ever dreamed that such a generic, boring mortal could be so infuriating? To be fair, I should have felt some gratitude to him, more than the others. He kept the girl talking. 
I learned so much about her through these conversations, but Mike's assistance with this project only aggravated me. I didn't want him to be the one who unlocked her secrets. It helped... You know what, I'm actually not going to torture you with any more of that. So, you know that character that uh, comes in every once in a while, like in sitcoms, who is excessively dull? And the joke of the moment is watching the straight man character react to how mind-rottingly bored they are of the moment with the the uh, boring character talking about, you know, how they chose the right shade of paint for their kitchen. That is this book. Only the book is the boring character, and you, the reader, are the straight man. And the joke is somebody else laughing at your torment! A good way to exemplify what reading this book is like is to talk about various mind-numbing topics. The time I misplaced my pen, but it was under my chair. The time I went to get gas and saw a red Ferrari. The time I went to get ice cream and they were out of sprinkles, etc. And this scene just goes on and on as everyone's sitting around the same lunch table and Mike is, is driving this conversation and getting Bella to talk. Ed is not even in this scene. So much of this book isn't Ed living his life. It's him watching someone else's story and narrating to himself. I'm not saying that such a story like that couldn't work, but the endless, vapid inserts he keeps slipping in are driving me headlong into a coma. And we get more references to Ed's monster. Like, the monster liked that, and the monster inside me hissed with annoyance as I struggled. Monsters. Guess after this, there'll be one less to worry about. Like, Meyer's attempting to personify this monster, this second personality in Ed, and it doesn't work at all. There are various ways to try to portray what she's going for. She, she's going with the childish, cringy uh, display. It, it's awful. The problem is that Ed's monster never actually manifests. The entire thing is just stuck inside of his head. So the monster doesn't come off as real. It comes off as his angry, imaginary friend. There's no sense of danger in this moment. It's ridiculous. Now, you want to see a monster inside a person done well, I absolutely implore that you go check out Naoka Urasawa's Monster. This is my favorite manga in my one of my favorite animes. It is gorgeous. Because the antagonist of the series, uh, Johan, has the, it leaves breadcrumbs occasionally taunting the protagonist and his team, saying, you know, things about how the monster inside him is getting bigger. Help. The monster inside me is about to explode. What is this supposed to mean? He has a split personality? And that works because we actually see Johan do horrible, dangerous things. The idea that there's this deeper level of evil inside Johan works on a character level and on a thematic level. Even if you can't find the anime, definitely try to find the manga. You'll love this story. It is a deep psychological thriller. It is glorious! And if you need more reason to check out the series, Glass Reflections did a spoiler-free review of Monster. Uh, it's summing it up way better than I ever could have because it would just, instead of 30 minutes of describing why it's a great series, it would have been me going total fanboy for half an hour. It's not until page 99 that we actually get a section that I would actually call almost kind of good. I mean, I'm probably being very generous, but at this point, I'm so desperate for something that maybe my mind is just shriveling up and, and looking for the bright side of things. There's actually a decent balance between dialogue and prose, so the, the pacing isn't like a dead snail that got stapled to the floor. Actually bouncing back and forth between Ed and Bella at a reasonable rate without Ed melodramatically loitering inside of his own mind. But it's not perfect because it does make me realize something very unfortunate about Ed's character build. Despite living for over a hundred years, Ed has a very poorly built past. Who was he before? What world events was he around for? Where did he live? What sites has he seen? He has room for an extremely colorful past, checkered with tragedy, joy, ambition, loss, love, and 
all sorts of trials. Yet given what we know about him and, uh, and his past from the books, he could have just sat in his basement in his underwear eating Cheetos and watching TV. Readers want to like characters. They want to relate to them. They want to feel some kind of emotion in relation to them. They want to feel compelled. But Ed provides nothing to react to. He has an immensely plain character. Ed's defining feature about his past is how vacuous it is. And we do get a few scenes of Ed's past, but they feel like exceptions to the rule. He wasn't a guy who regularly went out on swashbuckling adventures and doing all sorts of heroic deeds, uh, fighting in wars and protecting the innocent or anything like that. He was just some fucking teenager who moped around all the time and occasionally talked to people when he deigned to. I mean, it's better than Esme's character, at least. Esme is so boring as a character, you could replace her with an upright broom. And if you have no idea who Esme even is, thank you for solidifying my point. And there's a, the tail end of Ed's conversation with Bella. And I, I spoke before about his dialogue versus his, like the voice in his dialogue versus the voice in his prose and the character that he exudes there. And they're so different. It's actually kind of painful. So this is Bella shooting Tyler down. Uh, he, he's asking her to the, the like upcoming dance and she's saying, trying to say no. And Ed is sitting in the back just reacting to it all. The horrified expression on her face was priceless. It told me what I should not so desperately have needed to know. That she had no feelings for any of these human males who wish to court her. Like, dude, what century are you living in? I do not wish to take her. I would like to win her favor. Like a gentleman does a lady. That just does not compute with me. I don't me. understand what you're saying. Dig in the accent, but don't are understand you. Saying... you. Ed's tone and lexicon switch between modern day and pretentious Victorian Pratt. There are plenty of authors who have trouble getting different characters to sound different. Meyer's having trouble having one character sound the same. But through all of these trials of Bella almost getting hit by a car because someone else screwed up, Ed decides that Bella is, is far too clumsy to be left to her own devices. And he has this vision of a meteorite, like hitting her or something. The problem with waiting was that it freed up the minds for all kinds of speculation. Obviously, the meteorite was just a metaphor for all the unlikely things that could go wrong. If it was obvious, then why did you need to spell it out? If you have no faith in your readers being able to pick up on things like that, especially when they're easy, you're not going to give them much to really engage their imagination with, and your story's not going to have any staying power. But no, Ed needs to protect Bella from the metaphorical meteorite. So he breaks into her room. Yes, this is how Meyer justifies Ed stalking and creeping on Bella. He's just trying to protect her. I was repulsed by myself as I watched her toss again. How was I any better than some sick peeping Tom? I wasn't any better. I was much, much worse. I relaxed my fingertips, about to let myself drop. But first I allowed myself one long look at her face. Still not peaceful. The little furrow that was there between her eyebrows, the corners of her mouth turned down. Her lips trembled and then parted. Okay, mom, she muttered. Bella talked in her sleep. Curiosity flared, overpowering self-disgust. So long I tried to hear her and failed. The lure of those unprotected, unconsciously spoken thoughts was impossibly tempting. What were human rules to me, after all? How many did I ignore on a daily basis? Our hero, everyone! An unrepentant stalker. You got it from his point of view. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing's wrong. He doesn't give a shit. He's doing it anyway. I'm just gonna show you guys this. He then proceeds to watch and listen as she eventually says his name and he decides that he loves her. And from there all the way to the bottom, that's the, that's the stalking scene. And he, he decides from then on to break into her room and watch her to make sure that nothing goes wrong because of the various examples of Bella's life being put in danger of, you know, 
the one time that somebody else screwed up and almost hit her with a van. You know, you really gotta be careful about those midnight van raids on second floor bedrooms. <laughs> what I don't understand is, this is a second floor flat. <laughs> you ever seen Dukes of Hazard? <laughs> Obviously, Ed is very well appraised of the minivan massacre of 1996, in which a 10 story apartment building was raided by a bunch of soccer mom cars. God, this is stupid. But this revelation that Ed loves Bella kind of unintentionally reveals some contradictions within Meyer's world building. I was gonna save this rant for uh, the Breaking Dawn review, but might as well give it here at the very least. Ed realizes that he loves Bella, but why? Is it because he's drawn to her as a destined or bonded soulmate? That makes God look really cruel because they were born 100 years apart. Vampirism was the only way, way for them to meet each other. Right now in the book, it feels more like he wants her because all the boys in class want her. The entire chapter was just three guys, uh, three other guys hitting on Bella and asking her to the dance. Why include all of that if this wasn't the conclusion that Meyer had in mind? Or did she just not think her story through? Ed seems to be going for this because Alice predicted it in a lot of ways that makes the book look really fi uh, fatalistic. So I guess the book is going for why fight fate? I mean, the concept of free will within the Twilight universe is already kind of nebulous and ill-defined. This book is unreasonably long. So one of the things that Ed uses his powers for is stalking Bella, obviously, but he does that by reading people's minds and then seeing what they see. Like, he can actually effectively uh, see through their eyes. I followed her all day through other people's eyes, barely aware of my own surroundings. And you know what? I can accept that Ed's powers, as loosely defined as they are, can do this. That he can effectively spy on people by seeing what they see. But that doesn't work within the story that Meyer has already crafted. Do you want to know why? If that's the case, then why in New Moon did Alice stay behind in Italy when Bella ran to save Ed from glittering himself to death? If Ed can see through other people's eyes, why didn't Alice run with Bella while thinking, Bella's alive, she's here with me? I think Meyer either doesn't know how Ed's powers work, can't fit them well into the story, or she just retconned this. None of these options are good. Ed also breaks down how clumsy he sees uh, Bella as, uh, like she's tripping on sidewalk cracks and things like that, but it doesn't really necessitate a vampiric bodyguard breaking into her room at night. I was surprised watching Bella stumble through the day, tripping over cracks in the sidewalk, stray books, and most often her own feet, that the people I eavesdropped on thought of her as clumsy. I considered that. It was true that she often had trouble staying upright. I remember her stumbling into the desk that first day, sliding around on the ice before the accident, staggering against the low lip of the doorframe yesterday. How odd. They were right. She was clumsy. And that moment is punctuated as she catches the toe of her boot on the carpet and literally falls into her chair in class. Clumsy is one thing, but if she really has as much trouble as this passage implies, she should be required to wear a bike helmet and padding everywhere she goes. What's sad is that her clumsiness isn't, isn't even really a defining trait. It doesn't come up uh, enough for it to really be a trait, and it never affects the plot. Meyer's effectively playing on a meme, like not even a good one. And this clumsiness is used again as Bella stumbles twice on her way to Ed's table in the lunchroom so they can have a conversation, which goes on forever, let me tell you. But this is one of those moments where I actually found a difference between Midnight Sun and Twilight because this actually equates to page 87 in Twilight where no such trip actually happens. In a thankfully short description, Bella just thinks, when I reached his table, I stood behind the chair across from him, unsure. No mention of tripping anywhere. And this is me really overanalyzing this because I don't think that Meyer actually planned this too well, but... Meyer's writing choices seem to come in chunks, like her chapters will focus especially hard on one minor point, like Ed's jealousy, Bella's clumsiness, or Ed's bloodlust. Just beats the hell out of one point to the ground. On one hand, it suggests that Bella early on didn't really see too much detail in what was going on, or she's so used to her own clumsiness that it doesn't really register in her own perspective. But it does kind of suggest that Bella is such a welcome change in his life that Ed is soaking up 
every minor detail uh, that you know regarding Bella to the point where he's remembering things that she doesn't. It suggests a deep attraction to her to the point where he doesn't even fully understand it. His mind is doing this on an unconscious level, trying to absorb everything about this girl. Now, do I think that Meyer is actually going for this approach? No, I do not. I believe that she is forced into a template by the original Twilight, and she is inserting as much detail, no matter how mindless and unachieving it is, in order to make this story as fat as possible, possibly to justify a $30 price tag. There's an utter lack of tonal consistency throughout the book. Ed changes the way he thinks and talks frequently between chapters. This feels like the chapters were sorted together from different drafts and just combined haphazardly. It's almost like Meyer or her editing team didn't go through to make sure that the tone matched throughout the story. There's another verbatim conversation that I'm skipping because you don't need to be forced through that. And Ed just reinforces the same point about Bella over and over. Like this point when Bella suggests that she's okay with uh, moving to Forks if it means that her mom can be happy with her stepfather. The unselfishness of her comment would have shocked me, except that it fit all too well with what I'd learned of her character. And that's the other thing about this book. It feels like it's Meyer's attempt at a patch job for Bella, because what Ed does constantly is he'll think about how nice and how sweet and how, how very unselfish Bella is. These are traits that were maybe occasionally gleamed at, but weren't really defining. We also get this line as Ed steals a key from Bella's pocket. I curled my hand around the key I had just picked from her jacket pocket and inhaled her scent deeply as I drove away. Who sniffs keys? Next chapter, Ed's hanging out at home and we get some kind of setup almost for Esme. Like, it, I think that this is a glorious example of how poorly defined Esme is as a character. And if I've got to spell it out, she's Ed's adopted mother. Esme was upstairs, humming over a set of blueprints. She was always designing something new. Perhaps she would build this one for our next home, or the one after that. And that's all the detail you get. And it raises a few questions, actually, because you don't really get a lot of specifics. She's designing something with blueprints. Remarkable. Even when we get something specific about her, Meyer is remarkably vague. Is Esme an architect, an interior decorator, planning a garden, rearranging the furniture? We have no idea what's going on with a given context. Why is she even in these stories? I mean, I know why she's in the story, so Carlisle can have a wife. Why doesn't she have a personality? Ed goes hunting with uh, Emmett, and he confirms that he cannot turn his powers off. And then we get another scene where he's creeping on Bella and it gets so much worse. Bella was sleeping peacefully when I climbed up to her bedroom window early Monday morning. I'd bought oil to grease the mechanism, entirely surrendering to that particular devil, and the window now moved silently out of my way. He's not only stalking her, he's not only trespassing, he is now actively taking steps to make both of those easier for himself. Why is Ed even interested in Bella in the first place? Well, they're both attractive and in the same general area. Very romantic. Continuing on, more stuff doesn't happen, and then uh, Mike asks Bella out to the dance, and she says, you should ask Jessica. And Ed is watching all this, of course. It must be selfishness that made him blind to others, and Bella was so unselfish, she saw everything. You know, at some point, you've got to assume that your readers are smart enough that they can remember concepts for more than five seconds. The constant repetition is what kills it for me. Most of Ed's passive observations, aside from being continuous padding and rehashes from the first book, seem like an attempt to repair Bella's character. It's like Meyer knew that Bella needed a patch job, so Ed's here to give her some much-needed definition. Look, everyone, Bella's totally selfless. Just ignore that you could barely parse that from, their, from her in the first book. Also ignore that first-person narration is exceedingly easy to display characterization through because you are directly in that character's head. Look at Dresden and the multiple essays you could write analyzing him. Bella is flat and bland. Not much to really say about her. This book isn't just a lazy cash grab, it's a patch job. And speaking of patch job, Ed also goes through some of Bella's things and notices that uh, she has sense and sensibility and she is an Austin fan. Just because you own a book doesn't mean that you're actually a fan of it, case in point. And then we get the scene of Port Angeles when um, Ed saved Bella from the gang of assholes in the alleyway. 
And he starts reading the mind of the, like, leader, prick. This man, this abomination, was not the worst of his kind, though it was difficult to sort the depths of evil into a merit-based order. And then he starts waxing about, like, the past and how he used to hunt people down as judge, jury, and executioner. But that's boring. The discussion of evil and human nature is one that will never end and has so many tangents, parallels, and examples to list that we have a nigh endless conversation open to us. That being said, this one sentence added exactly nothing to the discussion. And while Ed is correct in his assessment that this prick is an absolute scumbag and deserves horrible things onto him, we don't get action in this moment. Ed grabs Bella and they get in his car and, and they leave, which is, I guess, the important part because Bella's safe. But Ed just sits there thinking about this. And it's dull. It, it's, we've got this tense moment of Bella in real tangible danger. And Ed just waxes on about the nature of evil and how he used to take these people out and destroy them. I mean, we get no real details of any of that, so this is just more empty nothingness. Not only does this internal monologue take away from the tense moment at hand, it also later on kind of feels like a separate patch job from what Meyer's doing with Bella. I imagine that this could be Meyer reacting to some criticism about how this prick was allowed to get away unscathed and how Ed knew what his intentions were and did nothing. So now this gaggle of assholes could go and prey on somebody else. So Meyer had Carlisle show up later and like get this guy arrested for something. Like this moment should be focused on Ed protecting Bella and saving her from these bastards. And instead he's thinking about his past and what he used to do, and does it in a way that isn't really reflected in the here and now. I mean, he thinks about how he's trying to be a better person, and later on he, he discusses how he's trying to redeem himself after being a killer for as long as he was, however long that was. So I understand why he's not taking action here, but prattling on isn't interesting. It doesn't take that long to sum up all of his thoughts. You could have done all of that in a paragraph, and he goes on for almost a full page. So Ed takes Bella out to dinner and we get the full, again, verbatim discussion from the first book. And somewhere in the scene, Ed gives a comparison saying, for just a second, I saw Persephone, per uh, pomegranate in hand, dooming herself to the underworld. No no, 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 no. So we have confirmation. This is a connection to the story of Hades and Persephone. And if you're not familiar with the story of Hades and Persephone, uh, short version, Hades coveted Persephone and uh, brought her to the underworld where he got her to eat six pomegranate seeds. And the rule is if you eat uh, food of the underworld, you're doomed to live down there. Well, he wasn't as bad a guy as uh, one might assume. And because she missed her mother and being up on earth, uh, it, she was allowed to remain up for six, month, uh, six months out of the year. And the six months she would spend uh, in the underworld was because of these six pomegranate seeds. However, this is like so many other times that Meyer attempts to elicit classic stories. Meyer only understands a very compartmentalized surface level understanding of it. First off, the story of Hades and Persephone is an attempt to explain why we have seasons. It's because in spring and summer there's life because Persephone is up on Earth, and then fall and winter when everything is dying and dead is because she's down in the underworld where she can't use her powers to bring the flowers and the grass and the trees and everything make, makes everything look all pretty. But also there's a very limited understanding of who the characters in this story even are. So Ed would be Hades and Bella would be Persephone. Okay, that's obvious enough, but Where's the pomegranate? What is the pomegranate in this scenario? It doesn't exist. It can't be vampirism because that is a one-time no-gozies-backsies kind of a deal. Bella can't 
be a vampire for six months out of the year and then go back to being human for another six, she's stuck as a vampire. So the comparison there, which is the only thing I can really think of in this comparison, doesn't work. Meyer's just using this here because uh, Hades is a dark, misunderstood bad boy and Bella's the really pretty girl. Those are such vague descriptions that you can use multiple other different story types. It's one of those things about comparisons that people try to make. You can compare anything to anything. It doesn't matter how thin the comparison really is. People will try to make that argument if backed into a corner. It's a flat comparison with nothing to back it up. It's pretentious, it's empty, it, it's... This entire book, man, I swear to God. The story, quote unquote, continues and Bella has her weekend getaway, the walk on the beach with Jacob as he floats the idea of vampires being a real thing. And Bella reveals that she got the story out of Jacob because she attempted to flirt and it worked better than she thought it would. Ed's reaction is dense. I could just imagine, considering the attraction she seemed to hold for all things male, totally unconscious on her part, how overwhelming she could be when she tried to be attractive. I was suddenly full of pity for the unsuspecting boy she had unleashed such a potent force on. Yeah, teenage boys are really easy to flirt with. Blinking the right way is seen as flirting. Belle right now is just a MacGuffin that guys are magically attracted to. Whether or not that happens in real life is immaterial. This is a story. Tell a story. But Ed can't tell a story. He's too busy overthinking literally everything. Bella reveals that she wouldn't care if Ed was a monster or not, and Ed thinks, I started to wonder if she was entirely stable. I suppose that I could arrange for her to receive the best care available. Carlisle would have the connections to find her the most skilled doctors, the most talented therapists. Perhaps something could be done to fix whatever it was that was wrong with her. Whatever it was that made her content to sit with a vampire with her heart beating calmly and steadily. I would watch her over the facility, naturally, and visit as often as she allowed. This would be fine as like a one-off joke, but this just comes off as Ed overthinking everything, filling the space, because if we had a moment piece where it's not filled with this mindless blathering, it's like the story structure would fall apart. Think of a good story as a thread. The best stories will have neatly tied threads that form a long narrative that uh, entertains and keeps you going. Berserk is a great example of that because it builds on top of everything that comes before it. The characters all have excellent moments, the universe is very well fleshed out, Everything is really tense, and you've just got to keep on going to find out what happens next. Berserk is a thread so finely spun you could mistake it for a metallic wire. This story is so frayed that all the plot threads and all the character moments split off in so many different directions that if you tried to use the thread for anything, it would immediately snap under the pressure. We also get this interesting bit of world building as Bella gets into the car, Ed smells her again, and his mouth was swimming with venom, and then he swallowed. Ha! Got him! So, venom is pretty much everything in a vampire's body. Like, all liquid things in a vampire's body. So at this point, this is effectively serving as spit. The question is, why? What biological purpose does this serve? Humans do it to help masticate and swallow food. Vampires have an all-liquid diet and don't really need spit. I'm really overanalyzing this point, and I don't care. But I bring this up because it's going to have an impact later on. Look, I'm bored, so I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit. See if I could find something that actually matters. Uh, Ed reveals that the guy that attacked Bella in Port Angeles got arrested. He's wanted for murder, apparently. Stated it as this repugnant creature no longer hunted. Cringe. There's no other word for it. This makes me cringe. It's embarrassing. There's a moment on page 221 where I actually had some kind of admiration for Meyer acknowledging that Ed still had, like, human urges when he points out that Bella's uh, sweater was kind of unflattering because it masked her slender figure. And was like, okay, that's actually kind of a humanizing thought. Ed 
still has some degree of desire. And then Meyer immediately ruined that by following up with the immediate paragraph. It would be a monumental mistake to dwell on the strange hungers that thoughts of her lips, her skin, her body were shaking loose inside me. Hungers that had evaded me for a hundred years. So Ed just got his first boner in about a century. Swing, swing. So several pages later, we get an example of one of many of Ed eavesdropping on Bella from another room. He would read the thoughts of somebody else, see the world through their eyes, and spy on Bella as Bella had a conversation with that person. It happens multiple times in the story, and Ed is just telling and narrating a story that he's not present for. I don't even know why this particular scene is in here because the first example here on page 232 is Bella and Jessica spending four pages describing why Ed was attractive. Oh my God, I don't care, move on with the plot. There are scenes that Meyer apparently couldn't do without, like later on when the Chris Hemsworth wannabe vampire attacks, uh, Bella apparently needs to get out of town, so she, like, gets angry at her father. We get that entire scene, all of it, as Ed is outside of the house and listening through the walls. Like, that scene doesn't affect him. This scene doesn't affect him. Why are we getting it? Why is it here? What does it serve? Ed is not present in that moment. He shouldn't be telling it. I have actually read technical manuals that paint better pictures than this. Ed is using his powers to spy on Bella's private conversation. Eavesdropping is one thing, but using supernatural powers beyond someone's understanding, even if they know you can do it, is still some kind of sketchy. He never even confesses that he's using this ability to spy on her private conversations, so the four-page conversation with Jessica is some new kind of creepy. You know what they say about eavesdroppers. Eavesdroppers never hear anything good of themselves. That was the saying. I've literally never heard that before in my life, and I can think of plenty of scenarios where it doesn't apply. These passages have no staying power. Read a chapter and see what you can actually retain. Almost every single thing is forgettable, and what isn't forgettable is tragically awful, like Ed abusing his powers to spy on Bella or being a creep in general. If I take a break and don't remember exactly where I was on a page when I come back, it's like I didn't read the page at all. These, these conversations are so thick and forgettable that I can't just turn to a page and remember what's going on. I could do that with almost every other book I've covered so far, but this one is the same repetitive garbage to the point where it's, it's not indistinguishable from itself. Ed is fighting with himself because he's worried about uh, you know, the damnation of becoming a vampire and dooming Bella to a life without uh, God, you know, subtextually. And that would be perfectly fine as a character motivator until Meyer stops using it about halfway through New Moon. Without any resolution, mind you, it just, she just stops. Will you just get comfortable already? I'm trying to work. The book's biggest problem is the sheer volume of bloat. There are so many unnecessary tangents and thoughts that lead to absolutely nothing that if we're all cut, the book would reach just over 100 pages. North from Winterfell is less repetitive than this. Uh, there's also an entire chunk of this chapter dedicated to hooking up, like, whatever their names are, Angela and Ben, I think? So it's like, hey, if you were wondering how those two characters got together, now you know this revelation will forever be a footnote inside of a different footnote. Benny. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. It also states that uh, his family would trade anything to be human, which is a perplexing thought because it raises the question, why does Carlisle keep changing people? Four members of the Cullen clan would be dead if not for him turning them into vampires. Is that preferable? Or is this like some sort of a regret they have where they, they would just rather be mortal and die eventually? Because if they want to do that, they can always go to the Volturi and ask for assisted suicide. We also get some moments occasionally of the other 
family members, the uh, other Cullens interacting here and there, um, which, I mean, they do desperately need definition. We actually do get a little bit more information about Emmett as a character, and he gets more than two or three lines for an entire book. But perhaps the one who gets the most definition would be Rosalie, who looks so much worse than she did before. I mean, look, I've called her a bitch, and I'll stand by that now more than ever because Rosalie was originally supposed to be Ed's wife. That's why Carlisle turned her, uh, which is kind of fucked up on a number of levels. But because Ed finds Bella more attractive, Rosalie instantly hates her in, you know, a very shallow way, mind you. And she threatens to burn his car because... Like, he's putting the whole family at risk by dating Bella. And just about every single scene she's in, Rosalie is snide and hurtful and petty and vindictive. She is overall a very cruel, unappealing character. And then we get to chapter 13, another complication. And this is one of the most damning examples of how pointless and frivolous this book is. The chapter starts the way that so many others do, where the, the two of them bump into each other and then they just have a discussion. But while this scene is somewhat reflected in the original Twilight, it didn't go into nearly as much exhaustive detail because there was something of a brief conversation and then on page 229, the conversation goes from uh, favorite color to uh, favorite CDs and things, but the entire conversation in Twilight is about a page. Not that bad, honestly. And Bella ends it with, it continued like this for the rest of the day. While he walked me to English, when he met with me after Spanish all throughout the lunch hour, he questioned me relentlessly about every insignificant detail of my existence. Movies I liked and hated, the few places I'd been, and the many places I wanted to go, and books, endlessly books. That was fine. That was a good way to sum everything up. You're getting examples of the, the conversation without being bogged down with every small irrelevant point. Chapter 13 seeks to undo that. And for about 18 whole pages, 18 of them, we get a series of lists of Bella's favorite everything. Insert it, it's probably in here. And all of it is useless. Chapter 13 goes into exhaustive, draining detail about Bella's character as Ed lists literally dozens of questions at, that she answers, all of which should have been cut or summarized case in point. True agony in reading. Most of these lists are missing from Twilight, which does suggest that Bella is such an incredible person that she shakes up the rut that is his unlife. He seems to memorize every detail about Bella and the interactions he has with her. Meanwhile, Bella gleamed over various details, suggesting she didn't know how important Bella was going to be in her life, and that this she was just going for the ride. That or Meyer was backfilling back where she could because she admitted to herself that Bella was a piece of cardboard and didn't know how to build character on top of how flimsy her template was. What's especially weird is that there's almost no detail in the original Twilight. For example, when Ed asks what music is in your CD player right now, Bella reveals that it's Linkin Park's hybrid theory. Insert your necessary emo jokes here. Compare that to the original Twilight, and Bella says, I realized I never removed the CD Phil had given me. When I said the name of the band, he smiled crookedly, a particular, a peculiar expression in his eyes. He flipped open a compartment under his car's CD player, pulled out one of the 30 or so CDs that were jammed in all over the small space, and handed it to me. You know, in theater, one of the things that they try to get you to do is workshop characters. You list all sorts of things to describe the character you're playing. You know, it's best if you can actually pull directly from whatever play or script you're analyzing but sometimes you've got to make stuff up and speculate on contextual evidence. The reason for that is not to have a list of interests and likes for the character. It's not to say, you know, arbitrarily, here are the top five favorite 
colors. They're your top five favorite CDs and all that stuff. The point is to get you into the character's head. Why is this their favorite color? Why is this their favorite CD? Why is this their favorite place to live? The why is the important part. Meyer spends 18 pages giving me list after list of Bella's favorite things, and it doesn't tell me one iota about her as a person. I can't tell you why any of that, with one exception, brown is warm. That is like, favorite color is brown because, I mean, it changes from day to day apparently, but tree trunks, rocks, dirt, it's all covered up with squishy green stuff here, and it just reminds her of home, apparently. That is the one thing of substance. At the very start, everything after that, for the remaining 17 or so pages, completely pointless. Especially when you consider that Bella has a very safe collection of favorite movies. For example, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, Vertigo, Pride and Prejudice with Colin Firth. These are all things that don't really tell you that much. It's, why does she like them? What's the reason for it? Monty Python and the Holy Grail is, you know, in many people's opinions, one of the greatest comedies of all time. I mean, I like that movie because I watched it with my father growing up. It was a bonding moment for us. I mean, it's a funny movie regardless, but that's why I like it. Why does Bella like it? Why is that one of her favorite movies? I had more fun reading Empress Teresa. Also, she tries stepping on my turf by saying The Princess Bride, uh, that the book was much better than the movie, when I can actually confirm that the differences between the book and the movie are so minor, it's barely worth discussing. There's also a very troubling pattern that I notice with a lot of the conversations that Ed and Bella have. Uh, and this right here is a good example. Shall we skip to an actual date? You mean like someone asked me out in advance and then we went someplace alone together? That sounds like a workable definition. She smiled the same, the same triumphant smile. Sorry then, I've got nothing. This pattern repeats itself probably dozens of times in the uh, book, especially in the last chapter and with all of Bella's lists. Ed will ask a question. Bella will ask something to clarify. Ed will confirm. Bella will finally answer the original question. This happens so much that I was actually able to denote it as a writing style. We get another reference to um, Hades and Persephone, but sometimes you just gotta say these words out loud to understand how dumb they sound. I wondered again how I could make this happen. Be with her without negatively impacting her life. Stay in Persephone's spring. Keep her safe from my underworld. What the f fuck? All the characters are preparing for the big mountaintop reveal when Ed takes his shirt off in front of Bella, and Ed keeps reading Alice's mind as she looks at the um, vision of the future, and in a moment that I find perplexing, Meyer keeps hyping up the possible tension. Oh my god, it's so pot like there's this this knot in the future, and Alice can't see what's going to happen, and it's like it could it could either go really well or really badly, and she's not sure what's going to happen. Like, bitch, we've read this book. We know what's going to happen. Stop playing with this. How many people are actually going to read this before Twilight? Even if there are a few, this story's been told so poorly by this point that I don't see anyone actually reaching this point in the book if they're not already diehard fans. Or very stubborn critics who just get paid to do this shit. What's interesting though is that one of the visions that they have is... Well, Alice and Bella are destined to be best friends and soul sisters later on in life, and yet one of the visions that Ed gets from Alice is Alice and Bella arms around each other, both marble white and diamond hard. Well, holes are holes. Also, Ed and Alice go hunting so that he's like f uh, full up on blood, so he's not tempted to eat Bella. Like they find a lion. It doesn't say mountain lion. There's something about, you know, the park's lion population, but we never get mountain lion or cougar or puma or anything like that. It's always just lion. So I'm not sure 
if Ed actually hunted down a real, with a big full mane, raised in captivity into the zoo, lion. But he ends up snapping its neck and, like, drinking all of its blood. Which means that this thing, if it was an actual king of the jungle lion, probably didn't really know how to hunt in an area like this. It's not exactly native to the Pacific Northwest. And then just to pad out the chapter a little bit more, we get a flashback to 1919 as Ed is, I don't know, being angsty or something over Christmas with Carlisle. And that's when he meets, I'm not gonna get this right, Siobhan, another vampire lady that Ed describes as the largest woman I had ever seen. Insert joke about Lady D from Resident Evil 8. Resident Evil is now canon with Twilight. Think about that nightmare. Or how much more interesting it would make Twilight. Don't touch the book. Nemo! You touched the butt. Ed also reflects on the first time he started slaughtering people. Even though the blood was not of the greatest quality, my first prey's blood was saturated with bitter tasting drugs. It made my usual fare seem like ditch water. The fuck is this? The fuck is that? The fuck are those? And so we get the big mountaintop reveal after chapter 16 and into chapter 17 as Ed takes off his shirt, steps into a sunbeam, and does a fabulous job glittering up the place. I can already tell this is going to be a roller coaster ride of disappointment. This next chapter is some of the worst anything I have ever read in my life. Ed reveals that he's a vampire and that vampires sparkle for some reason. And Meyer tries to play with the tension of the moment of, oh my God, is he going to drain her of all of her blood? And I, I'm sorry, just recounting this chapter is physically exhausting. It is so bad. This chapter is so awful that I actually had to get people to read it to me because I kept blanking out. I could not physically finish this book on my own. I had to cheat to finish this chapter. There are, there's some conversation between Ed and Bella, but really the and, and a, a vast majority of this is fluff that has been added in that wasn't in the original book. We get really stupid lines like, I was no rooted flytrap waiting for prey to land inside my mouth. Oh, I'm just glad I didn't live to see this day. <laughs> Wait a second. No! Ed goes back and forth thinking about how his family would react to this, what they would think. They reminisce on some past events. None of it grabs your attention very well. A lot of it is stuff you've already read and are already well appraised of. And physically, the only things that happen are Ed reveals that he's a vampire and does the sparkle thing. They lounge around a meadow for a bit, and then they wind up at Bella's car because it's time to go home. Take a guess on how long you think this chapter goes on. It's not 15 pages. It's not 20. This goes on for 40 pages. 40 pages of the most mind-numbing, physically draining, nauseating bullshit. I am sorry. I am just absolutely living at the moment. I am actually angry at Meyer that she would waste so much of my time as I went through this tripe fucking nonsense for this long. None of it, which so much of this could have been cut. You could reduce this entire chapter to like three or four pages and you'd miss nothing of substance. 
Think on sexy thoughts, think on sexy thoughts, think on sexy thoughts. I decided to try to juggle a few more tasks while still tuning in to the flow and ebb of her blood. I would see if the distraction was too much. First, I gathered information. I triangulated the exact location of the birds I could hear, and then by their calls, identified each one's genus and species. I analyzed the irregular splash that revealed life in the stream, and after equating the water displaced with the size of the fish, deduced the most likely variety. Categorized the nearby insects. Unlike the more developed species, insects ignored my kind as they would a stone by the speed of their wing movements and the elevation of their flight, or the tiny clicking sound of their legs against the soil. Ah, oh, shit, that's bad. As I continued to classify, I added calculation. If there were currently 4,913 insects in the area of the meadow, which was roughly 11,035 square feet, how many insects on average would exist in the 1,400 square miles of the Olympic National Park? Holy fuck, that's bad. What if insect populations dropped 1% for each 10 feet of elevation? I brought up in my head a topographic map of the park and started computing the numbers. Jesus fucking Christ, that's terrible, Jack. It goes on like that. It goes on like that. For 40 pages. The pacing in this book is so mind-fuckingly slow that I would support having Meyer arrested for committing a war crime. To anyone who would dare defend this book, read chapter 17 out loud and see how long you can actually keep any sense of excitement in your voice. This book is the physical embodiment of falling asleep in class. Reading this feels like a punishment. Ed also discovers that the monster he's been playing around with was a coping mechanism and not a very good one and it was like not actually disconnected from who he was as if that wasn't screamingly obvious from the very start eventually that nightmare of a chapter ends the date continues so the tedium is still in place but ed does give something of his backstory reveals he was born in chicago in 1901 and he got turned because carlisle was lonely really paints a particular image when he turns Ed before he turns his future wife, Esme, and he gives full backstories of all of his, his family, um, all of his siblings. This is stuff, if you have read the other books, this book comes off as so unnecessary because so much of the information is stuff that you've already come across. Go to the church and ask God to forgive you. Ed eavesdrops on Bella again for several more pages. Ed names drop another book called Tooth and Claw, which apparently is one of uh, Bella's favorites. I'm assuming it's one of Meyer's favorites as well, and she's just trying to name drop the book. I haven't read the whole thing yet. I'm going through it a little bit. It's actually not that bad. And according to one of the reviews on the back, this is Pride and Prejudice of the Dragon World. For some reason, we get almost a full page recap of chapter 17. I don't know why, and I'm not going to torture you by going over that again. Most of this book needed to be cut. So much of this slows down and distorts the book from what it's attempting to be. Meyer isn't a tenth as talented as she thinks she is. Meyer doesn't understand the first thing about characterization. You can have all these lists and interests about a character, but they don't tell me anything about who they are or how they're defined. Cloud Strife is a well-known character in video games, but it doesn't tell me uh, anything or bolster his personality if you find out that his blood type is AB, which is canon. That's because it's never visited in the story or signify anything meaningful about him. Meyer gave all these little details about Bella and Ed, but none of it develops the characters or tells the audience anything meaningful. And to demonstrate that, fans of the book should try to tell me some of the lists of chapter 13 without looking them up. The minimal amount of info most of them would be able to dredge up would prove that these lists are entirely vapid. And on page 410, we finally get 
an idea that Bella smells like lavender or freesia. And at this point, Bella's already asking about marriage, even though she has been on one date with this guy. We also get this curious line as Ed's thinking to himself about how, you know, difficult a relationship with Bella would be, you know, it's because he's so dangerous and says, the fact that we both also lusted was definitely going to complicate matters. I'm sorry to you. Oh my. One? No, it doesn't. That would actually make things easier, except for Ed's kind of, sort of, but not really religious tones that make him wait until marriage. Two, humans lust for one another due to instinct to help propagate the species. What purpose does this serve for vampires? Is this a, a leftover human instinct? What other human uh, aspects are left over? Again, vampire biology makes me wonder, like, what's the purpose here? Because oftentimes vampires are portrayed as very hedonistic. Not these books, they're, these, these are, you know, good Christian vampires who don't do the sex. Like that scene in Eclipse when Ed tells Bella to stop trying to take her clothes off. Oh my fucking god, that's canon. Virginity rocks. Remain pure. And this is complimented on the next page when Bella asks if Ed finds her attractive in that way at all. Except for one brief freakout in Eclipse, Bella has been a relatively sexless young woman. Now all of a sudden, she wants the dick! And Leia has lost her shirt. My cat's running around naked. It's kind of a problem in the way that the movie kind of dominates the way everyone understands Twilight and the extremely flat performance that Kristen Stewart gave. Yes, it was somewhat consistent with the characterization of the book, but you do leave out moments like this one where she actually tells a joke. Bella laughed at my confusion and stood up, stretching her arms over her head. That's all right, she assured me. I fend for myself pretty well. She raised one eyebrow and added with an arch smile, watch me hunt, and then she goes and grabs cereal. I mean, it's not funny, but an attempt was sort of made. Now, even though I've been pretty negative towards this book, and I'd say for good reason, there are moments that I think show a hint of potential. Some of the pages here actually show a decent flow, some degree of character, uh, it, like meaningful character, when Meyer takes a step back and actually allows the characters to be characters. It doesn't feel like she's trying to pad out the story by having Ed think about every possible iteration of whatever's going on in his head, and instead just allows him to interact with his family. The, the bit that we have with him and Rosalie are almost good. It, it's too much for me to really go over, so I'm just gonna have some overlays here on screen that you can check out if you want. It's not great in a normal sense, but it's pretty good for what this book is able to provide. I know that that's an exceptionally easy bar to pass, but I'm trying to be encouraging here. Unfortunately, all that praise gets thrown away as Ed tries to define the relationship after their single date. And for context, earlier in the scene, Bella said that she loved Ed, and Ed confirmed that you are my life now. Perhaps it was better to just get the no. Are you gonna tell Charlie I'm your boyfriend or not? Still looking down, she asks softly, is that what you are? Blah, 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 blah. I was under the impression that you were something more, actually. On the surface, yes, a headshot is a fatal wound, but beneath the gory reality, there's a lot that goes on when a bullet enters someone's skull. This is something that still stands really strong as criticism for the original Twilight, but I don't like this uh, disnified idea of romance where uh, you've, you've been with one person and you've been on one date and you just know it's true love and everything is going to be perfect for the rest of your lives. I mean, it's an absurd point, especially from someone as old as Ed, who should have the experience to understand what he's talking about by this point, but apparently does because he's a stunted potato of a man. We held hands and now I'm pregnant. So Ed eventually takes Bella to see his family, to meet his family for the first time. He plays the piano, they get some more sappy dialogue back and forth, and apparently this moment is so touching that Bella actually sheds a single tear and we get a moment that I had completely forgotten about, but actually getting it from Ed's perspective makes it so much worse. Carlisle had spent many years attempting to understand our immortal anatomy. It was a difficult task, based mostly on assumption and observation. Vampire cadavers were not available for study. 
His best interpretation of our life systems was that our internal workings must be microscopically porous. Though we could swallow anything, only blood was accepted by our bodies. That blood was absorbed into our muscles and provided fuel. When the fuel was depleted, our thirst intensified to encourage us to replenish our supply. Nothing besides blood seemed to move through us at all. I swallowed Bella's tear. Perhaps it would never leave my body. After she left me, after all the lonely years had passed, maybe I would always have this piece of her inside me. Mommy will live inside me forever! <laughs> So, that's a startling assumption, especially because in the original Twilight, this moment is so very brief. He touched the corner of my eye, trapping one I missed. He lifted his finger, examining the drop of moisture broodingly. Then, so quickly I couldn't be positive that he really did, he put his finger to his mouth to taste it. And then they just move on, like that wasn't incredibly weird. But this also compounds itself with my earlier question about vampire physiology like where where does where does the blood go how does it eventually drain itself from the vampire's body because it doesn't just magically vanish that's not how biology works sir what are we being too literal it has to uh dissipate somehow uh like the process of what happens to all of the water that one drinks. I drink the water, I go to a place to undrink the water, I wash my hands, I leave, and then I have to drink more water. Guess where that water ends up? Not in me. I mean, Ed states that vampires are porous and that's how blood gets through and nothing else, even though that doesn't make sense. But vampires aren't walking around like these big squishy water balloons filled with blood and God knows what else. The blood has to be extruded from the body somehow. And the only other thing that comes to mind is sweat. I mean, yes, I am putting entirely too much effort into thinking about that, more so than Meyer ever did herself, but I, it's just... I can't help it if the characters are going to describe things in such detail. If you're going to raise the premise, of course I'm going to ask questions! The house tour goes on, we get some random factoids that were just repeated in Twilight as well. Uh, also, this book contains the word orgy, so the giggling idiot 12-year-old in me is amused by that. Almost four-page long story about how he hunted down a pedophile and uh, killed him. But it doesn't really fit anything in. Bella doesn't react, and as soon as Ed's done recalling the story, he just moves on with an entirely separate tangent. Like, he just finishes up and says, you know, once he came back, Carlisle and Esme accepted him back into the family and then, Hey, this is my room. You want to check it out? And even if this is a story that's being told internally, this is Ed reflecting on his own life. Oh my god, I never thought a girl like this would fall for a guy like me, who used to murder the worst society has to offer. I mean, that's clearly what Meyer is going for, but Ed's not reacting to anything that he said. It doesn't feel natural. It feels like a tacked on story that's padding out this story. Besides, that happened decades ago, as if you can't possibly move on from something like that. Meyer's trying to set this up as a pivotal event in Ed's past, and granted, we should get some coloration of Ed's past in this book. It's told from his perspective, after all. The problem is, it doesn't feel like it's a natural extension of what's going on. We don't get enough of Ed by himself to really understand who he is by himself. This is Ed as an extension from the original Twilight. Ed isn't a character who happens to be living alongside Bella within this particular constructed narrative. Ed is just the same guy as he was in the first book, and you get some different word choices here and there. That's pretty much it. The fact that this little bit about Ed's past, that he used to hunt people, is such a non-point in the story at large. Doesn't really impact anything about who Ed is, who he becomes later on, his... he doesn't reflect on it in his choices later on, like during the climax, for example. If you didn't know this aspect about who Ed was or what he used to do, it wouldn't change how you really perceived him that much, like in the grand scheme of things. Meyer's treating this like this gigantic, pivotal moment in his development, 
And it's really not. When you consider its weight throughout the story as a whole, this is effectively the same thing as that time you missed the school bus when you were eight. Now, we do have something else that I want to talk about Alice, and it's mostly in how I hate how inconsistently Meyer treats her. Alice's powers change in every book, and there's no exception here. In Eclipse, we're told that Alice's powers are based on the decisions that others make. Okay, if you want to set them up that way, I think that can work, but it doesn't maintain itself consistently, and that's not what happens here in this scene. We have to wait for Thunder to play ball, I explained. You'll see why. Her concern was more obvious now. Will I need an umbrella? I laughed that this was her worry, and Alice and Jasper joined in. Will she? Jasper asked Alice. Another flash of images, this time tracking the course of the storm. No, the storm will hit over town. It should be dry enough in the clearing. Alice's powers depend upon the decisions of others, and yet somehow she's able to predict the weather. Now, this scene does match up well enough in Twilight, so it does seem like Meyer was just trapped by previous dialogue, but why aren't Alice's powers like actually consistent with, uh, with throughout the books. Why are they so sloppily described? Are clouds supposed to be capable of conscious thought in this universe? We get another eavesdropping scene as Bella talks with uh, Billy and Jacob, and Ed reads their minds as well. Leading up to the baseball scene, there is something that sort of matches Twilight, and this is an example, I mean, this is kind of an example of how Meyer could have expanded on this book to tell a slightly different story. The problem is, not only does it ruin previous world building, but it raises a lot of questions as to vampire biology again. Her lips opened against mine, with mine, and it seemed every part of me could think of nothing but deepening that kiss. Ironically, it was my basest instinct that saved her. Her warm breath surged into my mouth, and my involuntary reflexes reacted. Venom flowed, muscles clenched. It was enough of a shock to bring me back to myself. I reeled away from her, feeling her hands slide down my neck and chest. Horror filled my mind. How close had I just come to harming her, to killing her? I could see it as clearly as I could see her startled face in front of me now, a world without her. I had considered this fate so many times that I didn't have to imagine how the vastness of that empty world, the agony of it, I knew it wasn't a world I could endure, or a world in which she was miserable. If she, in total innocence, had touched her tongue to one of the razor-sharp edges of my teeth. Damn it, Bella! I gasped, barely hearing the words that twisted out of me. You'll be the death of me, I swear you will! I shuddered, sickened by myself. Now, originally in Twilight, this seemed like more of a good Christian boy sort of a moment. like. We can't do that. We're not married yet. Instead of, bitch, if you drink my venom, you will die. Her last words were, spit in my mouth. It's kind of a, a minor cutesy moment in the original story, but this is so dangerous that it almost led to uh, Bella becoming a vampire herself. Okay, but at face value, this seems like another question of why would a vampire do that? Why would they salivate at this kind of a moment? because it doesn't feel like they would need that if they just consume blood, if that is their primary thing. It just the, the idea of vampire spit doesn't make any sense from a biological perspective. Now, looking at it defensively, it could be that his instincts to, for lack of a better word, procreate were kicking in, because this is just how you make more vampires. You know, you stick them with some venom and there you go. I do kind of like how this moment was supposedly cutesy in the first book and terribly dangerous in this one, but it took me almost, what page are we on? 483 pages to get to this moment. And that is one of the only times that I can make that kind of comparison between the original book and Midnight Sun. If there had been several more moments like that, where we think one thing in the original story and it turns out, no, it's actually this that's going on, then there would be more reason for this novel to exist. But right now, it seems like a lazy, backtracking cash grab. And now for something completely different. 
Hey, check this out. I'm using Twilight as a bookmark for Twilight. Some sort of a Lovecraftian nightmare here. <laughs> and we get another moment of Alice's powers not making sense because she's predicting where Emmett is going to hit the, the ball once he's uh, up to bat. I mean, that's not really a decision. That's a snap reflex. It's It doesn't really require the same level of thought as thinking about what you're going to have for lunch. The only difference being if Emmett is exceptionally well-trained and it, like can predict where the general area where his balls are going to wind up. <laughs> Screw it, I'm leaving that in. Kind of like Babe Ruth, but I don't see anything in the text supporting that idea. And Ed cheats by reading Alice's mind as she reads the direction of Jasper's pitch. But because everyone is lost in the, uh, the fun of the game, they don't notice when the plot actually shows up. James, Victoria, and Laurent show up. They get a whiff of Bella and decide, you know, that she'll make a good meal, so they go eat her. And what's annoying is that after the fact, Ed just keeps thinking about how this possibly could have happened. Like, we get a lot of backtracking, wondering about, like, like trying to explain why Alice didn't see this as one of many things that Ed thinks about, and we get she had only seen the strangers in the clearing in the first place because they decided to interact with us. It wasn't easy for her to see outsiders unless they were with a member of her family. James would be mostly invisible until he decided to accost one of us. And again, if that's how you want to define the powers, fine, but it's got to be set up better than that, because that contradicts previously established canon with the rest of the series. For example, do you know how the Cullens make a lot of their money? It's not just because Carlisle is a very successful doctor, it's also because Alice cheats and plays the stock market. So how does she properly make these decisions? Because a lot of things that happen with the stock market are kind of sudden and don't really require a lot, or don't really get a lot of uh, leeway. So does she just have members of the Cullen clan hang out in the, the New York Stock Exchange and just like linger in the middle of a stock floor so that Alice can occasionally read people's minds as they're telling him to please leave the building you're getting in the way. Again, Meyer wanted to set this up but didn't consider how it would fit in with the rest of her story. Writers need to, when you are creating a magic system, you need to think about it from every possible angle. How does it work? How does it manifest? How is it countered? Very important, what are the limitations? The vampire powers in this series are just matters of convenience. They work when they work because that's how the plot needs them to work. And that's why Alice's powers seem to change every book. And it also, with Ed's perspective on this, with reading everyone's minds and getting the momentary notice, like he, he knows that James is gonna try to hunt Bella at this point because he read his mind, because apparently they're, uh, James is planning reconnaissance so that they can properly hunt down Bella. Okay, if you know that he is going to hunt them down, why not take care of them there on the baseball field? I mean, this was kind of a problem in Twilight, but it's more of a problem here because now you know that he's a threat. You can take him. He is severely outnumbered. This is the best opportunity that Ed and the rest of the Cullens have to keep Bella safe. Yes, there's the possibility of her getting caught in the middle of a, a like crossfire or something, but it's a better opportunity than, you know, like th this this desperately stupid plan they come up with. You'll see how how bad it really gets. Oh my God, this is so overdone. Especially considering how quickly they take James down in the climax. But if they did that and they killed Victoria as well, you wouldn't have the rest of the series. I don't see that as a bad thing. Ed eavesdrops again as Bella does that whole "I've got to get out of town, Dad." thing. None of which, of course, he's in the house for, so this, like, several pages here could have been condensed down to less than a single paragraph. You know, Ed just waited out by the car while Bella finished up and grabbed all of her stuff. Both James hunting down Bella because... reason. The Collins come up with a plan to keep her safe by splitting up and moving her around the country. One of the things I find hilarious, though, is right before Ed, Emmett, and Carlisle run off. The, the plan is they're going to create a distraction by running north while Bella, Alice, and Jasper head south. And Ed feels the need to give Alice a 
particular reminder. Bella needs to eat at least three times every 24 hour period. And hydration is important. She should have water on hand. Ideally, eight hours of sleep. I kind of love how the Cullens are so inept that they need instructions on how to take care of a human. As if that human was a little better than a pet. And make sure you take her for walkies! In a continuation of Meyer's really obnoxious writing style, she doesn't really explain how the, like, she doesn't fill in details where it could really help. We get this vague notion of Ed and his team had to run north into Vancouver and you know there's a lot of internal melodrama there as Ed constantly thinks to himself but we don't really understand how like the the details of the finer details of the plan for example as the time passed though I got nervous the sun was closer to the western horizon than the eastern we'd done nothing interesting but stopped to refuel a few times always leaving hints of Bella's scent so they're actually driving north in a car and leaving hints of Bella's scent, but they don't explain how they're leaving hints. Like, are they rubbing an old shirt on a gas pump? Or do they carry a spray bottle filled with her sweat? This is never explained. Either way, it's weird. We also get this really scant amount of detail as the plan is unfolding. Ask Alice if she sees the hunter quitting before we're set. Carlisle complied quickly. A few minutes later, the letter N. That settled my nerves. Why do we get Ed's thoughts in such detail that he monitors Bella's nightly sleeping patterns, but not when he's pulling off a daring rescue to save her life? James does figure out that Ed and the others are leading him off the uh, wrong trail, and attempts to prep his own trap, and so Ed thinks, I ran faster, eager to spring his trap. It's a trap! I know! He will just waltz right into it! He'll never expect that! But the trap wasn't a trap, it was an escape route, and... We do get this one moment that I kind of like where both Ed and Alice are utilizing their powers creatively. See, they don't know which way to go, so they, the three of them, Ed, Carlisle, and Emmett, plan to go, you know, they decide to go in different directions. Then they text Alice and say, which one of us will run into um, James? And Alice tells them a direction, they go that direction, and... You know, they do that a couple of times. It's clever. It's actually, it is a good moment that is surrounded by a, a vast sea of mediocrity. And unfortunately, that's all that the rest of this really devolves into. It just becomes Ed runs a little bit, thinks to himself about how bad this situation is and how dour his life would be without Bella. And then it repeats again and again and again. The whole thing becomes extremely monotonous. It was mid-afternoon when we came to another lake, crescent-shaped and not as large as the others he'd used to slow us. Without having to dis discuss it, we each decided to follow our usual search routes. Quickly, Alice responded, M. Backtracking to the south, then. This chase scene is becoming so repetitive that you can say, let's go with the usual plan, on a plan that you came up with three pages ago. The real issue with all these scenes is that they aren't being used to draw on the reader, tell an engaging story, or to illustrate a particular message or anything like that. It's just Ed and company running through the woods because that's what you're supposed to do in a story. This chapter is an adventure story told through padding. None of it will lead anywhere, and it's just the same problem told over and over again with minimal depth. Ask 100 people to map out the scene from Jurassic Park, and I imagine they'll mostly be consistent. Ask them to do the same with the scenes in this book, and they'll be so radically different or nondescript, you'll wonder if they were even covering the same story. So I only just now re uh, noticed that my microphone battery apparently died and I don't know how much f footage I just lost. Hopefully not that much, but as penance, uh, here's a kitty being adorable. They say hi to the internet. They say hi to the internet. Leia, do a thing. There you go. The key thing is, James escaped from Ed while they were tracking him, got on a plane, knew he had to go to Arizona somehow, and Ed and the rest of the Collins uh, meet up in order to start tracking him down. And it gets so dumb from there. How dumb does it get, you ask? There is a car chase scene that doesn't need to be there. And the cover-up plan to explain Bella's injuries is so ludicrous. It's it is the kind of bullshit fodder that internet reviewers 
would kill someone for. However, it takes them forever to go through the airport, to fly, to land, to meet up with the others, walk around in the car park to decide what car they need to steal. It's several pages of meaningless drivel as Meyer pads out the story because she thinks that in order to tell a story, you've got to lead the audience to every single point. Oftentimes, you can ignore plenty of things. If your audience is able to logically connect point A to point C, you don't need to worry about filling in point B. They end up stealing a WRX STI, which I guess is a super nice car. It doesn't really describe it anything better than that. I mean, we get some of the paint job, but as far as what it actually looks like, I don't know, you'd have to look it up. And they start driving as fast as possible down the interstate, weaving in and out of traffic. And we again get a kind of moment that's almost clever with Ed and Alice combining their powers because uh, they're keeping an eye on certain angles in the road as Ed drives and he's reading their minds in order to see where cars are and what the best place to uh, weave in and out of traffic would be. And, and that would be a good idea, except you'd gain maybe a fraction of a second. They're going over 100 miles an hour, so at that point it becomes more a matter of what the car is able to do within the laws of physics rather than the driver's individual reaction time especially when they have superpowers like what the vampires have. Eventually this goes up to, um, like, they go like 170 down the interstate, uh, including a bit of uh, nitrous. Here's where it gets really monstrous. So, the cops, like, get word that they're there and Alice predicts, you know, we gotta get off the road or something because they're coming for us and it's just gonna be a hassle to deal with. So they go and they steal another car. The driver of the Cayenne was climbing out of her car too her face in a scowl, and her ponytail swinging with rage. Carlyle darted forward to meet her. She had one second to react to the fact that the most handsome man she'd ever seen was responsible for running her off the road, and then she was collapsing into him. She probably hadn't even had time to feel the prick of the needle. Yes, it is now canon that Carlyle drugged a woman in order to steal her car. And then it gets worse. See, they needed to create something of a, a distraction, maybe a bit of a barricade to stop the cops from following them, so... Emmett flipped the gaudy STI into the oncoming traffic. It rolled into the second and third lanes from the right. A prolonged series of crunches began as car after car slammed on the brakes and then slammed into the car in front of them anyway. Airbags popped loudly from the dashboards. Alice saw injuries, but no fatalities. The police, already racing after us, were only seconds away. We don't know how many people were injured, how badly they were injured, how much damage was done to their cars, how much productivity this is going to cost these people in their lives. Our heroes, everyone. Reckless endangerment, left and right. And this gets so much worse when you consider that none of this actually adds anything to the plot. There is, th this chase scene leads to nothing. The police possibly get involved leads to nothing. Because of that, this is a narrative dead end. None of this chase scene, none of these injuries had to happen. This scene might ground the setting a little bit since cops chasing after someone going 120 miles an hour on the highway makes sense, but it doesn't advance the story. Cutting this scene entirely won't change the end result at all. They will still go from point A to point B and find Bella. And aside from the fact that this leads to nothing, the whole action scene that Meyer is attempting to build here doesn't work because she doesn't know how to set up an action scene. She doesn't really know how to set up much of anything. Ideally, your writing style should match something of the personality of the characters going through it. If they are rushing with adrenaline in order to save the day, fight the dragon, you know, save Bella in this case, then you should be using short choppy sentences because that sounds quick. It gets the reader through the moment and you're putting the reader in the same mindset as the protagonist. It's a very effective writing tool you can t uh, use. Alternatively, if the protagonist is supposed to be uh, really focused, really experienced in this sort of a thing, they could uh, use longer sentences with more calm wording. Focus on the important details, not the mindless drivel that Meyer's been providing us. But eventually, they do make it to the uh, ballet studio where James was 
holding Bella. And out of everything in this book, this was the moment that I was looking forward to because in the original Twilight, the big action scene where Ed and the Cullens finally showed up to save her, it doesn't exist. Uh, really, this, like the start of chapter 23 in this book, is Bella just going in and out of consciousness as the Cullens show up at the last minute to save her from bleeding to death. So because we got this from Ed's perspective, we actually had a really good chance for Meyer to expand on what happened that Bella did not describe because she was unconscious for most of it. Boy, are y'all gonna be disappointed by this. Through the door. It shattered around me, flying off the wall in pieces. The roar that exploded from my core was entirely instinctual. The tracker's head jerked up, and he dove for the crimson shape on the floor below him. I saw one pale hand stretch out in futile self-defense. The obstacle of the door had not slowed my momentum. I flew into the tracker, mid-lunge, throwing him away from his target, smashing him into the floor with enough force to crater the wooden planks. I rolled, pulling him over me, and then kicked him to the center of the room, where Emmett was waiting. For the entire quarter of a second that I was grappling with the tracker, I was barely aware of him as a living creature. He was just an object in my way. I knew that at some point in the near future, I would be jealous of Emmett and Jasper. I would wish for the chance to claw and slash and sever, but that was all meaningless now. I spun. And then it goes to Bella, and that's the entire fight scene. You had a glorious chance to have a real fight scene that actually amounted to something, and you spent all of that time focusing on a car chase scene that meant nothing. My disappointment is immeasurable, and my day is ruined. And you already know what's going on. Uh, James bit Bella, and there's a bit of uh, venom inside of her, so Ed's got to suck the venom out. Now, here's what's a little amusing. Because of the earlier scenes that Meyer has given us detailing what Venom is, we know that Venom is, among other things, basically spit. So that means that James, having bitten Bella, spat inside of her, and now Ed has to suck that out. So he did, in fact, swap spit with James before Bella. That is canon. Holy shit, it's a fucking canon. We also get this one moment here as Ed is sucking Bella's blood and uh, it doesn't really fit the moment. It doesn't sound organic, as it were. Stop, Edward, now! But Alice could see I was lost. I could hear her wondering frantically if she could pull me off of Bella or if that fight would just injure Bella more. The prose here does a terrible job of keeping the reader in the moment. Ed is frantic with consuming Bella's blood, but the prose comes across as logical recollection. It doesn't capture the chaotic madness of the moment, so the whole thing feels inauthentic. This is a great example. This entire novel is a great example of why less is more is such a respected rule in writing. But you know how that whole thing goes. Uh, eventually, they uh, Ed did stop in time and Bella was taken to a hospital to save her life. But apparently, they needed a cover story to explain Bella's injuries. You know, one of those questions that, as far as I'm aware, almost nobody actually asked. Like, I don't know if Meyer got a lot of criticism and she felt compelled to set something up to explain, well, if, if Bella was that badly injured, then how come no one followed up with a police report? Because it had nothing to do with the story. That's not what the moment was about. You. Why would you care? I mean, sure, it'd be a little weird, but you you could finish the story without that explanation. Twilight worked fine without it. It's one of those moments, it's like, <laughs> I never realized that I've never asked the question of how did they explain all this away? And unfortunately, the explanation they go with is drawn out, wasteful, and I'm not talking about your time, I mean wasteful of resources in universe, and it goes on far too long. Meyer also kind of shoots herself in the foot because we get this callback to the fight scene as 
Jasper and Emmett take on James almost by themselves. Jasper, mangled and ferocious, eyes sharp and empty at the same time, looking like some forgotten god or incar uh, incarnation of war, projecting an aura of pure violence. And the tracker had stopped trying. In that fraction of a second when he saw Jasper for the first time, but Emmett didn't know that, he'd surrendered to his fate. No matter that his fate was sealed once Emmett had gotten his hands on him, this was what demoralized him. If it was that easy, then why not have Jasper calm them down in the baseball field and tear them apart there? Uh, we also get confirmation that uh, Emmett's little stunt by tossing a, a sports car into the street caused a 27 car pileup on the 101. The rest of the chapter is a breakdown of this plot because what's going on is Alice is predicting the future and going everything step by step. Ed's reading her mind, so that's how we're getting all this detail. And they're making slight modifications as they go along. So what happens is they, they get a room at a particular motel chain. Uh, apparently they have a glass pane at the bottom of some stairs. Okay, I guess that works. And then Alice goes out, she steals four bags of blood from a hospital blood bank. I actually posed this question to, to uh, Twitter to find out how detrimental that would be. Like, is losing a bag of blood um, on the same level as misplacing a bottle of ketchup from the kitchen? Like, inconvenient, but you can always go out and get more? No, like apparently out of 10 from a couple of people who claimed that they were registered nurses, they said that losing four bags of O positive blood like this is like an eight or a nine out of 10 as far as how detrimental this would be to the hospital. They then take all of that blood and rather than use it to stabilize, like I thought they were gonna stabilize Bella. They're not gonna do that. Instead, they, they break the wi the window at the bottom of the stairs of the motel and spray the blood all over the goddamn place. Astonishingly wasteful. All for a cover story that didn't actually have to happen. It's even worse because this entire chapter ends with them actually going through the plan. I mean, fortunately, we don't have to relive the plan all over again. Meyer actually cuts that. But because this entire chapter was a vision, there's no sense of actual tension because every time they come up with any kind of a problem, it's just, oh, well, let's make a slight change in everything and then the vision resets itself. This is the safest kind of tension we could get, flat and with no impact. I'm not even sure why Meyer is writing this out. It's just Mella checking out into a hotel. Not the most clandestine work here. The lanes that the Collins are going through in order to cover up Bella's injuries are baffling. They include such steps as stealing blood from a hospital, breaking a window at a hotel and smearing blood around, stealing a third car for the night, pouring tomato juice onto shoes, stealing a new hoodie for Emmett, some plots require complexity, like the climax to Death Note. If Death Note had been solved with a quick, oh, that's the guy, and then, you know, everything is resolved in like two minutes, it would have been tremendously disappointing. Taking an easy solution uh, to everything there would have been anticlimactic, and it would have ruined everything the series had built up. This is just Meyer overcomplicating a single point that could have been written off in one or two steps. Granted, she was trapped by what she wrote in Twilight, but she didn't have to go this far. She worried too much about the petty details. This is made even more pointless when you consider that the doctor that they see at the hospital they take Bella to is an old friend of Carlisle's. See, at that point, especially with Jasper involved, who can control emotions, they could have gotten this other doctor wrapped up in the emotions of the moment. Like, oh my god, my son's girlfriend is hurt, please, buddy, you gotta help me! And that whirlwind of emotion, possibly aided by Jasper's interference, uh, would have gotten him more concerned with saving Bella's life rather than asking any pertinent questions. See, that right there, that is a better solution with fewer steps. So there's the old acronym, keep it simple, stupid. And that is good because it doesn't overcomplicate what you're setting up. Sometimes an overcomplicated plot point is unavoidable, but if it can be avoided, if you don't need to overstuff a moment in your book. Definitely do what you can to um, ease it out without creating too many plot holes for yourself. 
it makes it a, an easier, more enjoyable experience for the reader. They get Bella to the hospital, of course. While they're at the hospital, uh, Bella's mother swings by. We get a lot of other fluff as we meet a nurse called Gloria. And for some reason, we get another scene explained to us that Ed wasn't present for, but he's not eavesdropping this time. He's watching the videotape that James was making in order to torment him later on after Bella was dead. The problem is it starts out really dumb. Alice had left me with headphones. I put them on my ears. And then he watches the whole thing and this doesn't do anything to bolster the story from his perspective. It really just copies the scene from Twilight, but the, this book is, like, Meyer was bound to what was in Twilight. There was a certain script that she had to follow, but she didn't have to follow all of it. And because I am exceptionally petty, we get a typo in a professionally published book. I didn't know if Bella was aware of his shift in attention, of if she was just acting on instinct alone. Yes, every author writes typos, and yes, typos do sometimes make it through the editing process and into a published book, but I get to do this. I, this is my reward for finishing this stupid book. I get to be petty. We can't do anything right! And the rest of the story is just Bella's recovery and talking with Ed and then, you know, the prom. But a good portion of what's left are just stupid lines, so bear with me as I enjoy a little bit of catharsis. Like this moment when uh, Bella finally wakes up in the hospital. Shh, I insisted. Everything's all right now. What happened? She asked, her forehead wrinkling as though she was trying to solve a riddle. And then there's Ed thinking that maybe he'd have to leave Bella because that'd be safer for her. Maybe what I needed to do would be easier than I'd thought. Pain stabbed through the general region of my obsolete heart. We get another scene that Ed has nothing to do with as he listens in on Bella and her mother talking uh, in the hospital. Fortunately, he's actually in the room, so there is an excusable reason for why he hears all of this. But we still don't need to get all of it because it doesn't really involve him at all. And at the end of the visit, Bella's mom thinks about swinging by home because she really has to do some laundry and should probably clean out the fridge because that milk is months old. I get that she moved to Florida with the, the new husband, but if you're going to keep the old house, why wouldn't you throw out the milk first? Or better yet, use it up. Get some Oreos for that milk. And we get a moment where Maya wrote herself into a corner. So she was stuck with the script in Twilight where Ed admitted that he stole a car. You know, it was a good car, very fast. Except he actually stole two cars, three if you want to include the cover up. And he admits here that it was two cars. But why, Meyer? You could have gone back and changed that. It never had to be two cars. It never had to happen in the first place, but it could have been the one car. What is editing? This is gonna break me if I overthink it. Eventually, Bella's mom leaves, and Ed and Bella start talking again, and Ed assumed that Bella would want to move to Florida to be with her mom instead of moving back up to Forks, and they'd have to break up. And Bella says that that's not a good idea because you'd be stuck inside all day in Florida, she pointed out, not following. You'd only be able to come out at night, just like a real vampire. Yes, which is why he totally avoided Florida in Eclipse and never went down to Florida. Meyer, how the hell do you outline your books? What the fuck is wrong with you? And the conversation eventually steers to Bella becoming a vampire and Ed refusing. Bella, we're not having this discussion anymore. I refuse to damn you to an eternity of night, and that's the end of it. What night, bitch? You go to high school. Quit being melodramatic. And apparently it wasn't terribly hard for Bella to convince Renee, her mother, that she was fine and to go back to Florida. Her mother left two days before they did. So, uh, mom of the year. And then we get the prom scene, and it's as nondescript as everything else in this book. Tonight, Rosalie, Emmett, Jasper, and Alice were really dancing. They melded a hundred styles from other decades into new creations that could belong to any time at all. Of course, they were graceful beyond human ability. What does that look like? It's, describe it to me. What are they moving like? What are the motions observed as? This nondescript description is... Meyer, 
over-explains the irrelevant, and under-explains something that would color in the universe every time she gets the opportunity. And there's this other line that I really enjoy because it sums up so much of what's wrong with Ed's character. She tensed, Some things don't have to end. There was nothing I could say to that. She was right, but I knew she wasn't thinking of the same permanent things I was. Things like pain. Pain didn't have to end. Aww, are you edgy? Is you a little edgy edge lord? Are you? Are you? And the book ends the only way that it possibly can, with tawdry saccharine nonsense. Her fingertips brushed along the edge of my jaw. Look, she said, I love you more than everything else in the world combined. Isn't that enough? And then I could smile a genuine smile. Yes, it is enough, I promised. Enough for forever. This time I spoke of the real forever. My eternal forever. As the night finally overcame the end of the day, I leaned forward again and kissed the warm skin of her throat. And the end of that book is completely undermined by the fact that six months later, Ed is going to go off to Italy, break up with Bella, and try to emo glitter himself to death. Wow, that was pointless. So before I give the uh, final summation, I do have a, a few notes I wanted to go over. There were, there were a number of lines I had to skip because I just couldn't be bothered or I couldn't fit them in throughout the, the rest of the review, but just, uh... Wow. Because these scenes were already drawn out the first time I read them, going over their unbearably slow pace the second time when I already knew what was going to happen is pure agony. The narrative that runs through Ed's mind is chaotic and jumps around from topic to topic. While that does give a solid image of what's going on inside a racing mind, with thoughts darting around to and fro without much reason, it doesn't make for a fun or entertaining read. It's fine for brief stints, but make an entire book in that style is, and it's exhausting. Ed just lets his mind wander around increasingly shallow subject matter while nothing of substance happens in the world around him. Oh, uh, I also forgot this. So, apparently Jasper is originally introduced as Jazz, but that's all said before you actually meet Jasper, and it's how he's referred to a few times before the word Jasper ever shows up in the book. And I don't recall him ever being called Jazz elsewhere in the other three books of the series. So, for a while, I wasn't sure who the hell Jazz was. It almost feels like a retcon because Meyer thought up with this nickname at some point when she was done with the series and didn't know how to fit it in, so she just found a scene where Bella wasn't around and shoved it in. This book is unreasonably long. I find myself actually enjoying some of the book sections, but only by comparison to other sections of tedium. When Meyer actually lets the characters be characters and doesn't constantly drag the reader by the hand and tells them how to feel, Ed and Bella are almost tolerable. Passages of dialogue are at least uh, written well in terms of format and flow well. If Meyer wrote like this on the regular, I might not hate Twilight. I might still consider it shallow and devoid of character, but it wouldn't be the unbearable slog to get through that the series currently is. We get a scene of two friends of Jasper's who visit, who don't interact with Ed or Bella, don't interact with the story, and are never even mentioned in Twilight, so I'm not sure why they're there. They're not even around to make a cameo. They're mentioned. That's it. Ed's biggest problem, and the novel's biggest problem, is that nothing is succinct. Everything has to be drawn out so that every minute thought can be put into the ether. This book is over 650 pages. It is long enough to tell Ed's entire life story, and instead it only goes over what happens in Twilight. Actually, it goes over less than what happens in Twilight. Twilight has a longer timeline. Think about that. There's almost an intriguing plotline in play as Ed struggles to read Bella's emotions because his powers don't work on her, so he's trying to read her facial expressions and uh, judge her tone of voice. There's doubt that he's never had to deal with ever since turning into a vampire. However, this difficulty is only hinted at when it should have been a focal point. Definitely wasted potential here. Bella is a challenge for Ed since he can't read her mind. That challenge forces more effort for Ed, which seems to be what the relationship is based on. That and Alice is interfering. Bella likes him because he's handsome and saves her life now and then. Ed likes her because she's mysterious. While these distinctions are there in the text, they're written about in such a way that I'm not sure that Meyer's aware of them. Stupid line. Uh, Ed is talking about how much he wanted to be around Bella so he could smell her. So he says, 
I was there to burn my throat as much as possible. The main reason I don't have more tabs in this book is because it repeats the same sins over and over. It's always more of the same, and reading about the tenth time Ed stalked Bella in her bedroom isn't worth noting. Ed and Esme have an awkward mother-son relationship, especially considering that Ed was turned into a vampire before she was. To understand what this book is like and why its pacing is terrible, focus on every single moment of your day for an entire day and consider how many of those moments would actually make for an engaging story. Like when you picked out clothes to wear, or when you ate lunch alone with your thoughts. For most of us, the average day would be dull as dirt. This book is like Walden, except with less meaning and more pretension. Meyer's trying to write akin to a more classic style, like Jane Austen, but those styles are very out of fashion. It's like trying to impress someone with Steamboat Willie. At the time, it was a marvel, and for good reason. There is a reason to appreciate it for what it was and how it helped shape animation, but it's very out of style compared to what we're able to do now. Meyer is doing the same thing with a written word, only her style is a failed attempt at capturing what made those classics great. Dickens had layers of complexity. Meyer is just drawn out. Meyer isn't able to let her characters speak for themselves. While good writers are able to impose certain emotions from their characters just by how they speak or stand, Meyer goes into gross amounts of detail to over-explain how each character thinks and speaks, meaning that half a page of dialogue easily turns into two pages of dialogue, pretentious prose, and semi-analyzed thought crimes. Reading this book feels like a punishment. Meyer and L. James are terrible romance writers, but have potential as horror writers. Meyer spends so much time trying to expand her world that she forgot to add dimension. What she did was a literary equivalent of fucking with the saturation and saying, There! Now it's much better and more colorful! You might think that Meyer would take this opportunity to try to justify or reframe Ed's stalker behavior so that it was recontextualized to make him look better. And I would ask, can I have some of your optimism? Mine is bottomed out. If I did the audiobook, it would be measured in weeks, not hours. Parts of it would be interrupted with drunken arguments with a recording director about how I need more alcohol or drugs to keep going. Ed's need to interject his thoughts in response to every minor thought that other characters have suggests an inflamed sense of self-importance. A lot of the issues that really hold this book back are that there's very little dialogue as opposed to Ed's thoughts. Ed isn't a very insightful person despite his chapters upon chapters of thinking to himself, so we get these long, poorly described locations and thoughts that are uh, tedious to try to connect ourselves to. This entire thing was a testament to my patience. Reading this book was one of the most unpleasant experiences I've ever had in reading a book. If you say you're a fan, okay, fine, I don't care, but I will never be un able to understand you. This book is 650 pages long and it has nothing to say. It is a complete waste of time in every sense of the word and it deserves every ounce of of mockery that the internet has for it. And for some reason, Meyer thinks that we have not suffered enough because she's writing another two books from different characters' perspectives. One is from Leah, the one female werewolf. I don't know what story is going to be retold or anything, but I'm not looking forward to it. And then we get one from the dead eyed monster baby's perspective. God only knows what that's going to be like. Oh my god, I hope we don't actually get descriptions of the birth. Like, I wouldn't put it past Meyer to actually write that in. That's horrible. In her FAQ, Meyer said that Midnight Sun was tough for her to write because of Ed's dark personality. And she said that Ed... Um, was supposed to be a very anxious and pessimistic person. And you kind of get that, but not in a meaningful or deep way. It's more of, for lack of a better term, an emo way. Ed is kind of a whiny kid who has so much going for him in life that he doesn't really have any struggles or any real problems. Being a vampire might suck, but we never really get to understand how it sucks for him. He's got superpowers. He's got abilities that no human could ever dream of. Like, his biggest failing in life is that he can't find love, so... I guess he's supposed to relate to incels now. Riveting! But, so that I do close this out on something of a positive note, I do want to compliment Meyer towards her attitude on something. Because in the FAQ, she's asked, 
While the Twilight series is beloved by many, there are a few detractors. What, if anything, would you say to those who have negative comments about the books and films? And she responds, Nothing is for everyone, and it doesn't have to be. I never expected any, uh, anyone to have a positive reaction to my writing, so I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's ever said anything nice about my books. And I don't know if she's come out in other times to uh, slam detractors or anything, but I'm just gonna take this as it is right here at face value and say that is a wonderful attitude to have and I wish more people actually saw that. And I, I do wanna make something clear. I will criticize Twilight as much as I bloody can. A bad example can be a wonderful teaching tool and Twilight, the entire series, is a magnificent tool in that regard. But I don't hate Meyer. For some reason, the idea has gotten into people's heads that criticism equals hate, and that is exceptionally childish. I don't think Meyer's a bad person. I bet you she loves cats and dogs. I bet you she donates to charity. I bet you that she you know, loves her kids immensely. I think she's an absolute hack when it comes to writing, but she can still be a wonderful person. I bet she gives more to charity than I do. We need to get away from the idea that criticism is the same thing as hate. Yes, in the age of the internet, for the sake of entertainment value, jokes and hyperbole are played up, but it shouldn't be taken as vitriolic. Through criticism, we can improve, and that's especially important for writers. We writers absolutely need criticism in order to improve. Criticism can be a good thing if it's given constructively or to serve as a lesson, like what I try to do in these videos. Meyer's not immune from criticism. I'm not immune from criticism. You're not immune from criticism. It's a fact of life, and it can make things a lot better. And hopefully, Tyra Banks can take the same lesson because I'm about to get into this and I don't know what to expect. Beauty is in the smize of the beholder. Oh dear. <laughs>